Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Way of the Truth Warrior. My name is David Whitehead. Very happy to be here with you once again. And I've been trying to stream on YouTube, but it seems to be giving me some more problems yet again. For some reason, they don't want me streaming on there right now. So hopefully we can figure that out. But I am streaming over on Periscope. You can check that out on my Twitter, which is at DWTruthWarrior. Um, I will also be uploading the archive to my channel on YouTube as soon as this is complete. Um, this is a show that manifested literally today. I was checking out a link that a friend of mine had sent me on a very prestigious professor here in Canada. His name is David Black. And he is a communication and culture associate professor. And he's been on all the mainstream news here in Canada. And his mission right now during this entire lockdown is to go to task against conspiracy theories. And so I thought it would be a good practice. First of all, I attended his webinar. He did a webinar today for the university here in uh, Victoria. Um, he uh, was going through all the slides. I've got some clips. I've got some of his slides that we're going to go through. And he's essentially trying to debunk any level of questioning or conspiratorial type of thought. He's talking about the impact that it has on society, the impact that it has on the individual, how dangerous it is, and also what to do about that crazy uncle that you've got that's always ranting and raving about conspiracy theories. And so I thought, you know what? I had Michael on the show months ago where we did the, the psychology of the conspiracy denier, where we were defending the alternative research field and the field of conspiracy research. And I thought it'd be time to do part two based on this. And I got to say, I was shocked at the amateur level of this presentation today. Um, and you're going to see that as we bear it out. And I would actually love to eventually have a conversation with Professor Black. I would be more than up for that discussion. But um, since he hasn't gotten back to me or was not answering any of the questions I was posing him, we're just going to have to do it like this. So, uh, Michael, welcome back. Good to see you again. I hope you're well, brother. Thanks, mate. Yeah, great. And again, part two. Yeah, this is something that's really pernicious. So it's, we, we're right within our rights to, you know, rebut it and show the infantilism of it. And also maybe uncover some of the deeper reasons of why they would even bother. Because if we're meant to be in a free speech society and the First Amendment really meant anything, they just leave us alone. They go, oh, yeah, they got these crazy ideas. Don't bother me because I'm busy with something really important. But the fact that they spend money, right, get these groups together. There's a Newsweek top BBC program just recently when doing exactly the same thing, trying to create tools, you know, and as some sort of a conveyor belts, you know, for the invalid. Because, you know, you're not thinking right and you're buying and purchasing based on your own free will. And my God, we've got to stop that. You know, we're going to create a lot of tools for you. So, you know, because we've already realized that you, you fall into traps as soon as we let we turn our backs on you, you know. So some 20 somethings are not going to tell you what you can click on and what you can listen to and have all sorts of tools and factoids, you know, to help you make a decision because we know you're just so fucking infantile, you know, this kind of thing. Oh, yeah. And that's what it is. I think that was a key point you made in the first um, episode that we did is that this is authoritarianism in a way. And even though they will present it as, well, this is just we're just making an inquiry. You'll see there's a lot of soft language that covers this rebuttal. But then in the, in the next sentence, they'll actually condemn it and, and make fun of it and deride it. And what I always have a problem is, with is when they don't actually define terms, even though they say, OK, we're going to define terms and you'll see I'll play it in a second. Uh, we're going to define terms, but then they don't define all the terms that you need to for a debate. And then uh, we're not going to criticize anybody, but then we're going to criticize everybody that is looking at any of this kind of stuff. And especially with the nature of the time we're living in right now with this whole lockdown, with the pandemic, um, we have now, I just, right after, right before I tuned into this webinar today to listen to what this professor had to say, I was watching the live stream that was happening on London Real where 164 doctors and experts from different political backgrounds from all over the world from different medical fields were actually voting on this live stream against the protocols that are being used by certain agencies that i'm not allowed to mention or i'll get booted off and sort of the mainstream narrative perspective on just this one instance in history that we're living through right now which is this entire lockdown scenario and with the uh, the amount of draconian laws coming in as a result etc so i was just watching that and then switching over to this webinar where this professor is essentially just saying, well, anything that goes against what the media is saying and what these official organizations are saying 
is just deemed conspiracy theory. And you go, well, why are you just dressing it up with that term conspiracy theory without defining it, as you'll see? And yet all this is, these are people coming from within the highest levels of academia, the highest levels of the medical research field, the doctors, nurses, they're in the thousands now. It's not even the hundreds. These are just the people brave enough to come out and speak publicly. Um, and yet these people are just censored. So when we see people being censored and not given a voice, as you were saying, Michael, where, why don't you just let them sh talk and say what they want to say and just let people see that all of our theories are ridiculous and then make it up their own minds. I thought it was a free society as well. So these were some issues that I had. And so let's get into it with his introductory statement. It's about three minutes long. I think it's better to just listen to him to give him a chance to, uh, you know, lay out his case and then we'll take it point by point. So here is the first clip from Professor David Black. So I thought we could start it here by addressing, you know, some, some sort of uh, uh, ground rules, some sort of definitional points so that we uh, are talking about the same thing. And then we'll proceed into an analysis of, of what conspiracy theory is, how it, how it registers for the individual, how it manifests at a societal level, and then some advice to deal with your crazy uncle or aunt uh, uh, with respect to people who have surrendered to, the, to you know, the seductive power of conspiracy theory, be they trivial or be they um, kind of dangerous in nature. What I want to do today is, is as follows, and what I don't want to do as well. I, I'm not here to investigate the claims of any particular conspiracy theory, I, so I, I've taken off my tinfoil hat. Um, we're going to attempt to understand conspiracy theories as media and cultural phenomena. There are different ways in which we can approach them. Uh, we can look at the history of them, for example. But we're going to take them apart structurally and understand how they work as, as again, media and cultural phenomena. We are in this presentation, I am anyway, going to be quite critical of conspiracy theory in general. I, I'm not here to, to honor it or pay it homage or, or give it any uh, unwanted credibility. Uh, I'm going to be styling it, again, as a professional theorist, as bad theory. And I want to sort of persuade you why it's bad theory. That said, uh, in history. Uh, and we, only, we have the, the recent example of the coordinated Russian government attack on the U.S. presidential election in 2016 as, as a, <laughs> a, a, a grand conspiracy of making. A lot of different actors, stickers, and, and, and others involved in, in attacking uh, uh, you know, the U.S. democratic process. We also want to uh, sort of uh, allow here that I'm not here to counsel credulity or gullibility with respect to the nature of power or to, to communication within the public sphere, which we might call public communication. Skepticism is a necessary part of every democracy. All of us should be watchdogs with respect to the nature of power and public communication, just as our, our media and other institutions can be. But I wanted to find a, a great distance between that necessary, healthy, democratic skepticism, that's really our obligation as citizens, and the cynical assumption that power is generally conspiratorial and that public com communication is largely propaganda. And that's a distance in which we're, that's a space in which we're going to be exploring things today. Because ultimately, conspiracy theory is, is a publicly circulated cynicism of a profound nature that is essentially given up on, on hope of change, on hope of the good intention of people uh, in civil society or the, the functionality of our institutions. Wow, a lot to unpack. Any initial thoughts, uh, anything jump out at you there, Michael? Well, it, it, yes, because there's elements of truth in what he's saying. So uh, these are sophists, you know, they do have academic uh, credibility, although I'll probably use that with a small C. But the thing is that now that they've got that parking space and they've as an individual matriculated to this elitist level compared in the history of the 20th century or the rest of the world, getting to a position in which now your demagoguery, you know, uh, implant is burning hot, you know, and looking down on everybody else and, you know, surveilling and calling yourself a theorist. Um, it's pure ar arrogance, you know, uh, 
uh, but even on the most basic levels, have you got anything better to do? I mean, anybody could just say that. Why are you wasting time with this? Because actually, the people who represent a conspiratorial mindset are so utterly few. I would wonder why they're drawing attention to it. Mm. Interesting. Because it's counterproductive. If you if you leave it alone, it'll go away. That you know that's the normal. But if you keep screaming from bullhorns like on this Newsweek program and on other programs. You're just attracting attention to it. You're just actually selling, telling people, go over and check these madmen out. Yeah, but well, that's that's what they've been doing for ages, and what it's been growing and growing and growing as a movement, right? By addressing it. So then I think to myself, hmm, are they really against it, right? Or in some perverse way, you know? I and mean, again, I'm a speculator. If you see movement in the long grass, you've got to think what it might be for. Could it be the predator even attracting you to the fact that the grass is moving, you know, for another reason? So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here. But basically, you know, straight up, it's demagoguery. It's the academic uh, crown and gown, town and gown. We're the tarnies. They're the gownies, right? Uh, they're not royalty anymore. They're not sanctimonious priests. You know, like in Ireland, the look, if, you, if you had a delinquent child, you didn't punish them yourself. You called a local priest. And the local priest came in, grabbed you by the ear, took you upstairs to the attic and thrashed the living shit out of you, right? And that was just with a stone throw ago. People watched, you know, the Magdalene Sisters or other movies on the Catholic Church in Ireland and elsewhere. People should know this. Now, these characters are in the same pond, right? They just don't have the strap anymore, you know, to beat your ass till you're black and blue and go, don't do it again. You know, I don't want to be called around here again. But basically, to all their intents and purposes, that's who they are. They share the same demagoguery idea. Uh, to look at everybody else as the unwashed masses. You know, what did Irish from say? You know, it's not going to be slaves. It's going to be robots. Meaning that we don't raise the machine. Uh, we don't raise the machine up to being, you know, the organic computer, uh, you know, do the faculties we can. That was never the agenda. The agenda is to reduce the human being to the level of literally a robot. You know, and then if, it's your, if you're a robot, if you're cybernetic, and you can be in your consciousness, then you can be programmed. But then moving, shifting from that uh, basic rebuttal up into the, you know, I would say a much higher dimension. And this was more, I'm thinking back now, because when I heard that, I was thinking back more to architects of control era, you know, and prior. And that is that the great fear here is not about conspiracy theories because he said i'm not going to address individual theory yeah i know because right. you'd fucking lose right exactly but the thing is that uh, uh and that's not to say that they're not spurious conspiracy theories i agree you know with him on that nobody's ever and probably pretty much everybody in the conspiracy movement will will agree that's why they don't want to talk about individuals because they'll find we're very rational people but if you move back to the high, one of the highest perspectives on this, you get to understand that this is about their great fear about the expansion of consciousness. They're presenting it as a case against tinfoil hat wearing people, when in fact you must decode it as the Brzezinski fear, one might want to call it, that there's a mass awakening. It's, and when it starts, even if it starts small, it's something you won't be able to stop. The internet has always been a bugbear for the for the mainstream media with 50, 60% of their viewers just dropping it, not even right. reading newspapers or watching their crap. So it's always been something they want to strike back at. And then these ponces who are apologists for the system are also deadly and afraid of something far deeper. And that is that, you know, your cerebrum is expanding. Your vision of the world is expanding. You're not just a troglodyte anymore. You're not a medievalist anymore. Religion, no, we don't want it. Politics of what we know, the two-party system. No, we don't want it, right? Corporate socialism. No, we don't want it. The TV, you know, gobbledygook, right? And the extravaganzas. Only the lowest, you know, mentality wants it. We want, we want something better. We want Lord of the Rings. We want, you know, help my mind grow. I, I can suspend, uh, uh, you know, uh, disbelief. I can, I can think very, very clearly. I can take on these great concepts. So, you know, he, he, he didn't mention anything there about, you know, going after the producers of uh, National Treasure or the Da Vinci Code or anything like that, you see? So really what's happening is these people are apologists for the entire bankruptcy of the, of the entire academic world. I could sit here for the next week 
and regale you endlessly, right, from A to Z of all the meltdown in academia, right, from the dead, pick D, Dead Sea Scrolls, pick N, Nag Hammadi texts, Christianity, right, we can go through the whole thing and show you the meltdown, the absolute Alice in Wonderland kitchen of chaos, and we could have Matt Presti on, right, Let's go into the whole physics, the, you know, the meltdown within physics. The highest thinkers in the land, people like Richard Feynman, won't even answer questions on the mystery of time. They go, don't, you know, and he's not the only one. Go, don't ask me about time. I'm the top brain, but don't ask me about that because I got no answers for you. See, so that's non-demagoguery. When great minds are able to go, I am great in my mind because I know what I don't know. Uh, and Ian right. McGilchrist or Richard Feynman. Uh, 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 Bruce Lipton and uh, uh, R Richard Sheldrake. Is this guy going to tell, tell me that the Sheldrake and Michael Cremo are conspiracy theorists? Where's their tinfoil hats, dickhead? So in my work, coming back to the middle ground, in my work, what I do is I never make a statement that's not corroborated by a higher authority than piss pots like him. Now, you said he's quite eminent. Yeah, but there's always more eminent than he is. There's Charles T. Tart. He'll talk about consensus trance. There's Thomas Kuhn. Maybe we can read a quote from him later on about paradigm shift and, and the impossibility of paradigm shift for guys like that, the straight up and downers, right? So what they're afraid of, going back to the higher octave of this, is that they are actually seeing and measuring a change in consciousness. Now, the individual person is probably not aware of that. A lot of people listening to us who love you know conspiracy theories and do check it out and have open minds, they're probably not aware of how rare it is to be into these conspiracy paradigms. It's a very, very recent concept because before you were under the boot of the authority. You know, Schopenhauer said new ideas are always resisted. So Most we people weren't even literate. They weren't even literate back in the day. They were forced to listen to That's just right. these few, you know, priests or the demagogues or whatever. It's only 150 years or so that any kind of scholarship regarding the Bible and Judaism came about. 150 years people need to realize how recent that is before that there was no bible scholarship to speak of there was no academic groups there was no branches in an academic in an academic sense right some of the things that we take for granted today are really really new and conspiracy theory as they're calling it is really a young type of thing i've written about this in a, one of my articles called refuting the refuters right and how they're immediately trying to uh, rottweiler us back into the square, back into the box, because it's new, they don't like that it's new, and they don't like the fact that we're victorious, that we own and ground every day. Wherever we turn to look at ancient aliens, those programs, look at History Channel, right? There's a tremendous love of those programs. And there has been even since the 70s, but it, you know, it, it couldn't be compared to what we have now and the budget that we have now. You know, a few little dinky shows back then, you know, couldn't compare to the what you've got in terms of budget. Uh, you've been part of them yourself, so these shows, so you know that, right? It's big business, and it's and people love it. That's why it's big business. Well, these other uh, these other toadies see that, and they see their walls crumbling, right? They see people in their class ten times smarter than they are. The age of the orc, right, is over in that sense that they cannot control you. They cannot stamp out the light. And so they may be going after conspiracy theorists. This is a catchphrase they use, you know, and they jocularly and scoffingly mention that to get a few cheap laughs from the proles at the front. But what they really mean is we are deeply worried, folks, about the widening and the beauty of the writers, right? These men are writing books voluminously. They, they're articulate, uh, a lot of them, right? And they're uncovering many mysteries that we have for centuries kept silent. And we are, uh, we don't like it. That's what, to me, it's really all about. It's a form of demagoguery, and we are completely correct to, you know, rebut it. Absolutely. And there was a few things that jumped out for me. Uh, number one, we're going to get to it in a minute, but I was waiting from the beginning of this presentation. I was waiting for his definition of terms, because when that term conspiracy theory gets thrown out, the problem with it is, is that both of those words by themselves are legitimate. I mean, we have the theory of evolution. It's still called a theory to this day by the most eminent evolutionists. Okay, they'll still call it a theory. Um, and then conspiracy, well, we're going to get into the actual legal definition of the term and what it means. But when you combine words together and you weaponize it in the, against the public, you've created a nice little basket 
that anything that comes out from or an organic movement of the public, see, because they just want everything, as you say, to be top down. They don't want organic thought to spring forward from the free market of ideas, which is why we're being censored and why I'm having difficulty streaming this right now. Um, so even those words, conspiracy and theory, are plugged into Google's AI system and they're hunting channels every single day. So that means they don't want a conversation across the board. And these kind of academics are promoting this as sort of like, this is the way you debunk competing religions. That's how you do it. You have these sophists that go out and they attack competing theories. That's what this is. And the other thing that he said, which was completely fallacious, was that people in conspiracy theory, they don't want change. They don't want solutions. Uh, they just have a natural distrust for everything and everyone and all of society. Um, they're dangerous. You know, some of the quotes are going to get into. He has a, it's not just him debating a theory. He actually believes we're dangerous. And there's already been um, discussions in my country and I'm sure other countries around the world where they literally want to fine you for talking about conspiracy theories or any kind of alternative subject matter. We've heard the director of the World Health Organization come out and say, or sorry, not the director, the, uh, the CEO of YouTube come out and say, we're going to censor anything during this whole pandemic that doesn't fall into this one category of getting it from these particular people. Even though there are now thousands of experts that are more highly degreed than the experts that work at these other official institutions that are coming out in protest against these actions that are being taken. So my question is, when did we stop using the scientific method and the journalistic standard to actually investigate these things from multiple angles and then make up your own mind? So when people come out here and like this and they're like, well, I'm not going to speak in any kind of favor of it. Um, I'm not going to get into specifics and you'll actually see that he contradicts himself because he does get into specifics later because he needs specifics to make fun of it, but he doesn't want to talk about the specifics because he knows if he really opens up the can of worms, it's going to start to spitball in the chat room, which is what started to happen when I watched it happen. Um, and so, yeah, a, a lot of just right off the bat, amateur statements. And then let's do slide number one here. Because this, I actually took his slides. These are his slides. And just so you know, in, this, in the actual live stream, they said, we're going to be emailing this. It's for free. Spread this out as far and wide as you can. We need to have this discussion in our society. Uh, we're going to email everybody that came to the webinar, the, the slides. So I took that as, all right, you've got me the slides. Let's talk about them. I believe in a free discussion. So that's why I'm doing this. Okay. So here we go. He says this. Here's a few points that he makes right off the bat. We have here a history of conspiracy theory. I'll just go through the points really quick. Ancient and medieval examples of conspiracy theory include anti-Semitic conspiracies alleged against the J people. I can't say that on the air. And less disastrously, conspiracy theories relating to the Freemasons and depending on the country in which you live, you know, Catholics and Protestants. The first modern conspiracy theory arguably dates to the 18th century in Bavaria and a secret society founded in 76 by a philosophy professor, Adam Weishaupt. Weishaupt, living in a very conservative part of Germany and looking with envy at the Enlightenment happening across Western Europe. Uh, just look at the way he structured that, eh? Tell me which side of the political aisle he sits on. Anyways, sought to create a secret society with an ideology that sought to illuminate life there with fresh ideas, a central theme being a critique of religion. Oh, so he's already, he's already on Adam Weishaupt's side. He called the society the Illuminati, and over time it grew to have several thousand members, many of whom were well-placed in German society. The Illuminati was identified by the Bavarian government as a potential threat to the government and dissolved by the state authorities in 1785, nine years after its founding. So basically it just went away. But the Illuminati live on in the imagination of conspiracy theories as a secret cabal that even to this day is thought to manipulate world events, a kind of super conspiracy. Now, Michael, you've done like countless articles. We've had many discussions where we've gone into very detailed specifics with citing, with historical examples, with, you know, evidence galore. And when you hear these people just kind of graze through it, and I think he spent, I timed it, he spent a total of one minute and 30 seconds talking about the Illuminati. So one minute and 30 seconds from a prestigious Canadian professor versus... I think I have 137 books on the subject, written many of them by academics that we're going to get to. So your thoughts on that whole history chronology that he gave there? Yeah, it's all bogus. They pick on these, uh, you know, sacred cows. They pick on the Illuminati all the time when they want to do this because there is a certain knee-jerk reaction against that. Mm. But in our podcast on Unslaved, you know, uh, Illuminati Factor Fiction, I think I proved the case that they exist. 
Yeah. I wouldn't have been pursuing this for 30 years of my life if, if I was mad. See, so when they call you out that you're a conspiracy theorist, it's one way of them really saying that you're insane. So if mm. I was to talk to him, I'd say, then how do you, how will you go about proving that I am clinically insane or in some other way, deeply neurotic, whatever, you know, pathological, let's say, because uh, I've been doing this research since 1982. How would you then even go about you know, because you may have to call in a couple of psychiatric friends to do it. Yeah, but see, I happen to know that psychiatric people don't follow that lead. They don't even want to know about this stuff. So the man's platform is not as strong as he thinks. And even today, if you actually, uh, you know, meet one of these academics, often these are awards that have been given. They're probably not as intelligent as people think, right? The whole, the whole edifice right now is selective and, and, and it's, not merito uh, it's not a meritocracy anymore, right? from philosophy, all through the sciences, all through the humanities. You get picked based on your political, you know, uh, uh, allegiance and affiliation and, and other factors like that. You're not actually given awards and degrees anymore based in actual you know, knowledge. This was a long time proved by many scholars, particularly Alan Bloom, you know, and other people have written on this. So I'm not intimidated by their so-called, you know, degrees hanging on the wall. So, if somebody has even five, 10 years behind them researching these things, they're going to have to take every one of those people and even probably somebody who's got a multiple you know, publishing deal with some of the top publishers in the world. They're going to have to sit those people down and, and try to go through a process, an impossible process of diagnosing them as demented or pathological. How do you even do that? That would be evident if he could bring something and say, we have, we've, we've gone and selected 10 of the world's leading, we've got Geodra Griffin strapped on here, you know, so he's got a muzzle on because we don't want him talking. And we've got this guy and that guy and, and you know, got seven others, right? And we have a team of experts here in the white coats and they've proven all of these people clinically insane or pathological and, and show me the documentation. Then there'd be a reason to get up on, the, uh, you know, the hind legs and really you get into it. This is fatuous. This is for the proles. This is for the dumb show. These are the same people, mind you, mark you, that these are the same people. If they had the power of the, of the old priestarchy that ruled for two and more thousand years, if they had the, uh, you know, sort of, a, you know, Victorian crackdown, you know, the high stratification of, the, of these, you know, academic hierarchies, they would be telling you, they would be, they would be working to prevent you even asking the basic gateway questions that you come on this planet to ask. That's how dangerous these people are. Don't worry about conspiracy theories. They're going to go, oh, you want to ask, uh, who am I? Where am I going? And what's my purpose? Go ahead. I love it. There's the conspiracy theorist. The other guy's going, what are you asking those questions for? We're going to find you. I right. think you need to be locked up. You need to be tested. What are you here for? Where are you going? What's it all about? And what's your purpose? How dare you ask those questions? You were meant to be an obedient worker. Get on with it. You see the difference? So the, 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 the fear is the... We are, they're not breaking out of their paradigm, paradigms, right? We are busting the paradigms from the outside, mavericks, amateurs, ordinary folks. That it's a terrible, terrible fear. And so we, they look back and say for two and more thousand years, in one way or another, the human race has been entrapped, right? Entrapped by psychiatry in the latter you know, years. And that goes back to almost 1770. You've been entrapped by religion right and you've been trapped by state government with all of its laws and regulations and all the things right we want you that way how dare you get inspired by great movies great physical teachers like krishna murti right bruce lee all of you we don't like that and we're going to strike back and we're going to test your muscle to see you know how how efficient we how efficiently we can do it so yeah it, it, it's something i've been uh, you know monitoring for a very long time but when it comes to the illuminati it's actually not even that difficult. He actually picked a really stupid one there because it's actually quite easy to prove. Yeah. Right. Because uh, Moses Mendelssohn, Adam Weishab, Baron von Nige, right? The Duke of Brunswick, all of these people's writings uh, show you that such a group existed. As to the fact of it dying out long ago, I've already debunked that, right, in, in my work. And also, what he doesn't tell you is that the, at the, at the most astute conspiracy theorists, have proven the existence of this and other secret societies of a Masonic type by using the classic etymology and symbolism roads, where does that lead me, as hermeneutics, and he's not even mentioned that, that there are legitimate keys that any symbolist, right, even from within academia, would have to acknowledge the cross keys of the Vatican, the mitre, 
uh, the, the pyramid with the eye, right? Dude, we are following two disciplines that you will never mention in any of your writings on the, you know, get them to write shit down, get them to confess. They'll never mention those two her hermeneutics. And of course you don't, because those who use it have broken the, the, the trance. Those who've used it, making the greatest, biggest budget movies that the people you won't go after and call conspiracy theories. And I've been doing it for since Alfred Hitchcock and before. And then the, the people like us who are also using those uh, uh, decoding decipherment techniques have come upon the existence of these secret societies. We haven't done it sitting behind some academic desk in Cornell. Nobody has. Right. And the ones who have done it from, say, within an academic framework, I know all about them. I've read their books. I've got them. People like Nicholas Hager, seven books. Let's get Nicholas Hager and this guy together and we'll see who wins the argument. A man who categorically has proven the existence of the Illuminati and its royalist, elitist funders debunking the myth that they were anti-monarch, you know, monarchistic and anti-royal. We've gone so far down the road. Professor uh, Robinson in 1793, proofs of a conspiracy. Coming up to date, you've got Anthony Sutton from the Hoover Institute. Right? It dwarfs this guy's credentials. People at the highest level, even government, Gary Allen, right, and other senators, people at the highest level of the military. Yeah, I was what just was popping that? up. Uh, I was just, right? I was just popping. Yeah, I was just showing people as you were talking. The just I had a title there for proofs of conspiracy by John Robinson. He's a professor of natural philosophy and secretary to the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and he wrote it in 1798. So I guess he's must be another tinfoil hat wearing kook. He's another. I'll tell you another one too. Go to the Wikipedia. Type it anti Masonic society. It was only headed by President Adams. Quincy Adams, president. That's right, President. Didn't that Washington from some? Didn't Washington call yes. out the Jacobins and the Illuminati when they called the out the Illuminati? Group? Yeah, yeah, they're from memoirs that are in the in the um, Library of Congress. Go figure. We've got them all through my my work. That's why I say everything is you know everything's stated from higher sources. The 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 the, the deans of various colleges, right? High level people, General Smedley Butler, you know people like that. Yeah, put an anti-Masonic uh, society, America, 1700s. If it's good enough for President Adams, it's good enough for me. That's what you just say to a guy like that. You don't get into big, long debates with him at all. Is, it, is that it? Yeah. Uh, this so one, just... yeah, it says it's also called the anti-Masonic movement. Um, mm -hmm. it, was the, it was the first party in the United States, strongly opposed Freemasonry and single-issue party, and later aspired to become a major party by exchanging its platforms. And on and on we can go. It had some of the highest figures on the land, uh, the highest merchants, the highest statesmen, even the president endorsed it, was one of the key members. Look, you know, and a fucking story. And so the people he talks about in Europe, did he mention the people who labored to expose, right, uh, the Illuminati? Right. Uh, it just helps them because a lot of the books that were written, you know, weren't translated into, into English from French and German. Yeah, but they're there. You can go to museums and see all the Illuminati documents. Okay. But what he focused in on there is this is, is this thing they always try to do, which is point out that the Illuminati couldn't possibly exist. In the videos I've made, I list about 10 right, different orders that predate the Illuminati by at least three and probably even four to five hundred years, all which exist in our world today. There is nothing more to be said. Right, let me repeat that again. There's over 10 organizations mentioned in our programs, so, most of them predating the so-called Illuminati by 400 years, at least three and probably up to 500 years. All of them still exist today. Move on. Done deal. How could you then propose that the Illuminati, which only existed in the late 1700s, right, early 18th, uh, late 18th century, couldn't possibly exist? Like all these plonkers try to tell you, nothing could be more fatuous. These orders not only exist, they gain in strength. And part of that gaining in strength is to conceal their existence, right? But many of these orders, uh, you know, exist today, both in the East. There's an Eastern Illuminati groups that ex still exist today in different forms. You know, like the big G on the Masonic diadems, that's for the Gionum, right? A super secret group of, uh, you know, Sadducees and Pharisees. And the list goes on. And there are very prominent 
more than the level of journalists you see because he's really the other ones we did in program one were all a bunch of journalist type levels right he's more of an academic and but most of the people who go after conspiracy are not academics believe me they're not they wouldn't waste their time on it it's the journalists now it just so happens that when uh, tests were done on the intelligence core team, you know, like IQ, journalists are amongst the lowest pawn slime. I'm not making this up, folks. Please go and check this. Fact sad, check this. Yeah. Journalists make up the dumbest people in general knowledge, common sense, and IQ. Sorry to have to break that, you know, and the editors are a little bit, you know, slightly more smart. But your average journalist is among the dumbest person that you will ever encounter. And yet they're the main vanguard against these mighty people that we could quote. You're going to put them in front of an Anthony Sutton or a Senator Gallery Allen or, you know, so many others I could mention, a Geoard Griffin. Give me a break. And you can prove it even on a, on a soft level by going and picking you know, 15 of the most prominent journalists today and see if they've even written a book. You know, writing some rubbish for some newspaper that says some editor, you know, corrects. Yeah, show me the list of books that you've written, actually, that of substance to prove the point that you can then, you know, you, you have that credibility. So... Yeah. yeah, you can easily expose these journalists as being absolute flunkies. Well, and then of course he always goes with the they always go with the typical attack that um, people that are into conspiracy research are somehow they have a prejudice, and he does a whole section of this. He has a prejudice against certain people. So he used the example of what's going on right now with the virus. He's like, well, look what's happening. This is just a, this idea that this uh, virus started in uh, a lab in Wuhan or whatever is just boiled up by a bunch of conspiracy theorists that are racist against Chinese people or whatever. And this is where they come. And then he would say, well, anybody that's into the Illuminati and the history of conspiracy, they're just anti-Semitic or whatever. And it's like, well, no, when we've analyzed this, We've nobody gets out of this alive, man. We've we've looked at Catholics, Protestants, Jewish people, is uh, Ismails, um, uh, so many others that have come, both have come out to expose these conspiracies and that also are involved with it. So this isn't something, as you've always said, Michael. This isn't just a partisan issue. This isn't left or right. They always try to make it look like that as well. And there's another section where he conflated, he he listed views of conspiracy theorists and they happen to be views that are held by the vast majority of conservatives and he was trying to say that he was conflating the two with the a political opponent which again is showing his hand of well you're just yeah. critiquing you're just pointing at the other side of the island going conspiracy theorist when we know that's not the fact michael you know vindicate me here you've we've been talking about this for years we're not against a group of people we're not against a religion practice whatever you want we're not hitting but we're looking at very very elite people that move in all of those circles and shake hands with other so-called enemies behind the scenes so this is that alone is a proof of a conspiracy it's not about attacking a particular group or race of people well when it comes to say zionists and stuff like that you should go and ask this guy first is he what does he think of winston churchill for a start you know you can checkmate him right mm. Nine times out of ten, he, uh, people like him will go, well, the greatest figure in the world of the 20th century, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and when he was a young man, he wrote extensively on the Zionist conspiracy. And not that I'm saying I agree with the Zionist conspiracy, anything like that. Let's just keep it straight. Churchill believed in it and wrote extensively about it. Checkmate. So in one minute, you're saying he's a hero. The next, he's a tinfoil hat-wearing guy, and I didn't say I liked him. Mm -hmm. Right? You've had people all over the world of great eminence talking about the world conspiracy. Right. And I try to, uh, you know, from different backgrounds, them. but the type of person. Yeah. But why do I not then get into endless debates now that we have this thing called online and blogs and all of the, and these, as you said, it's open forum. There were these people. Why don't I personally go and, you know, get into their faces because I'm as a disciple of Ayn Rand, I already know that these are people who are, they have a crippling fear of the truth. And they also know least it's like what I said about journalists. They know least about what matters most. So when you really understand that, those two formulas, right? They have a crippling fear of the truth and that they uh, know little about what they're talking about. I wouldn't waste my time. You know, I move on to continuing to write or continuing to produce and then saying, here's, here's what I produced. And if you really want to critique it, then go right ahead and we'll do it line by line. But you know something? They don't come to me. They, they avoid me like the plague because one look at any article any podcast seriously if they try to do that homework they come away with a a, a a ream of names of some of the highest academics in the land like charles t tart like uh, rupert sheldrake and they go uh, and michael talbot and others i could mention right and carl pribham uh, not that we're not even talking about the higher level shellings and hegels here right 
We're talking about people that would be out of the same institutions that this plonker comes from, right? They found something else to do. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> right? It's so true. when you're when you're solid in this movement, you're standing there outside their door going, yeah, anytime you're ready, they'll never come. Mm. Right? They pick on the low-hanging fruit, David. That's right. And the, young people you do win a couple of points with that. Yeah. And they also there are lunatic people out there in the conspiracy movement that are in fact the low-hanging fruit as well. Yeah. So, you know, so yeah, they'll win those points there. And that gives them the feeling that they're really, you know, lion tamers, right? Like the little pussycat. But they won't come after the heavy hitters. They will not come after, you know, uh, G. Edward Griffin and people of that ilk, you know. But but I, in the Refuting the Refuters article, which can be found on the Michael Sarn site, you know, I bring up some very simple, it's a short article, and I bring up simple points to show you how, you know, bankrupt they are. And even in other pr presentations, you know, we go even much deeper into that. But I don't involve myself with talking to them because they're toxic. And I already know that they are gatekeepers. They are entrappers, right? They're afraid of the movement of people breaking all the paradigms, not just some, but saying, yeah, I don't listen to media. I laugh at media, which is what's happening now. Yeah, I don't follow religion. I laugh at it. Laughter kills tragedy, folks. And these academicans, right, they are in deadly fear. You know, because all, not all media is bad. I told you the great movies, which have helped mm. people open their minds. First, it comes in through the right brain, but eventually you start to say, you know, there's a lot to this. Because everything that you take away from the normal paradigms, when you bust it, you can immediately replace it with something that's more, uh, you know, something that is uh, substantial. And one of them is that the world is run by a secret society, as we, or more than one, right? So as they see humanity, creeping slowly some of them in the dark but at least moving in that direction do you realize that that's the big bust right there yeah right and the, and the ones we're talking about that are in the real fear they hire people like this to try and turn back the tide but you, you're not going to be able to stop it it's not a stampede i wish it was but you know it has its own movement people like me have had to get used to that it's not never moved as fast as i wanted when i you know how many years ago but i've had to adjust to that goes at a fucking snail pace but actually i took out the measuring you know and it actually is moving so okay <laughs> thank god you know three leather three-legged donkey trying his best right yeah uh, or, you know a fucking uh wall-eyed pigeon going run and run most of the time what the hell but at least we are making some ground so i've committed you know to continue it in my life but i told you that they, for them to really win their case because you, you, know, you take their case and then you project it forward what what would happen if they would win how would they really you know blow the skittles away They'd have to prove that people like myself who studied this for years and yourself as well are in some sense pathological. Since that's not going to happen. There's no psychiatrist. You know, they're not all bad, these psychiatrists, these psychologists. They know when you're perfectly sane and there's nothing wrong with you. And they're not going to diagnose you in the way this guy would have in his wet dream. He would like to. But that's all bogus. It's all for the proles. They still sell tickets to the dumb show. Mm. And their major fear is one consciousness is expanding in a way that they... They, they are completely against. And two, there's a movement of the masses towards uncovering the great secret that indeed government is hierarchical and there's people at the top who run it. They don't want that. That is a huge, huge fear. Right? Exactly. Uh, exactly. That, just that simple awakening. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, yeah, hundred percent. Well, let's bear this out a little bit more for people. So this is going to be clip number two. Let me just roll this here. This is a, a personal definition of conspiracy theory. I've, I've tried to make it uh, you know, just very simple for, for teaching purposes here. Conspiracy theory is, at the level of the individual, an organized and seductive form of irrational thinking. And conspiracy theory, at the level of society, is a highly contagious cultural phenomenon with pernicious, that means kind of, um, uh, you know, damaging, disruptive, you know, uh, negative, and tangible consequences. And we're going to ex be exploring those two levels because I, I think we can appreciate conspiracy theory as something that happens in someone's head, but also happens in the world. And they have somewhat uh, uh, different forms and different consequences and different different natures. Now, the history of conspiracy theory is, is a, a, a long and winding uh, tale. And sadly, conspiracy theory is, is, is not new to us. It's new to the modern world. It's been this war for thousands of years. Um, for example, going back to the ancient and medieval worlds, we have plenty of examples of anti-Semitic conspiracies being used against against Jewish people. And less disastrous 
recently and more recently a uh, conspiracy tending to secret societies like like the Freemasons. Depending on which country you lived in, in in Europe, the Catholics might be the source of the conspiracy or the Protestants, depending on the, the dominant religion in that country. But in, in the modern sense, arguably the first conspiracy theory emerges from a secret society formed in Bavaria, this is sort of pre-modern Germany, in the 18th century, and founded by, a, a, of all things, a philosophy professor, uh, Adam uh, Weishaupt. Now, Weishaupt. Now, I'll leave it there, because he, he just goes on to talk about what I already read out. He's just going through that one slide. Um, but, you know, I just thought... The way he's trying to go about this is to try to make it seem like, well, this is all just the perspective of people that are just not educated. And so they immediately will assume that whatever uh, religion they're not a part of or whatever political philosophy they're not a part of, the other side is engaged in a conspiracy. And this is the this is the traditional thing. This is why there's a huge movement right now to try to demonize anybody that's considered right wing or even center right or even center, or even liberal, but that has a few conservative points on their side, they're still all put in this big, giant, far-left conspiracy theory basket of deniers. And this is the terms they're using. They're using, like right now, they're using uh, uh, virus deniers. They're, ba they're bringing deniers in. They were using, um, so I guess all those experts, those 164 plus experts and doctors, they're all deniers, right? You got the Holocaust deniers. You got the climate deniers. You got the whatever deniers. And even those terms, denier or theorist, they're used in a weaponized way that is similar to what happened in Romania and in uh, the Soviet Union and in Berlin and all these places where they use the word traitor. And I had a, a friend of mine that was born and raised in Romania, watched the whole thing plummet into communist totalitarian control, fled there to come to Canada um, and was trying to escape communism only to realize that they just moved to Canada. And now they're realizing all the same steps that were taken in Romania to take it down are happening as if on cue here in Canada. And they came on the show. Everybody can go back and check that out uh, to tell their story, to try to illustrate that. And what uh, this woman told me was she said, we didn't, they didn't use conspiracy theorist or denier. They just used the word traitor. So as long as they can create that idea in the mind of the public that anybody questioning the establishment, the government, the media are deniers, theorists, and traitors, then the average, like you said, the, the average uh, Joe Schmo is never going to question these experts because, of course, these are the experts, right? And there's this fallacy that happens, Michael, where these experts tell us, normal people, to trust the experts. But then I say, as I'm sure you would say, well, which fucking experts, man? I got laundry lists of experts that disagree with you. So if you're telling me to trust the experts, which experts do we listen to? Yeah, that's basically, they, they're self-imposed. That's why I call it demagoguery. You see, uh, they say that a, sign, a true scientist has the most open mind of anybody. He never discounts anything until it's factually and scientifically proven right. not to exist. This guy would have had to go on to every single one of us, interview us for hours and hours and hours to do anything like what he's pretending to do, you know, in this, uh, again, classic journalist headline way, soundbiting. They wheel out the Illuminati without even describing what the Illuminati is. That, that, he, it's so tawdry, that's why I don't ever bother. You know, or with any naysayers you meet in the street. And as a matter of fact, the strange paradox of all is, why do they climb out of their holes right now? Well, I've kind of already explained it because now more conspiracy theorists, theories have been proven correct mm. in the last lot of months. We should be partying. We're, we're vindicated because even the man in the street can now see something seriously wrong with the world. Remember I said on our first podcast about this uh, lockdown? What, what, what was my point that, oh, yeah, now is the time to observe? Mm. Right. And now's right. the time to take stock. And one of the things to take stock about is how fragile the whole infrastructure is. We get to see now, oh my God, you know, we may never taste potato chips again or so, you know what I mean? You're like this kind of thing, right? And yeah. Now all of that's really valid. Right. Because tomorrow they could turn around and say, I'm sorry, we don't want you walking any of your dogs. So we're going to come around and put you know, and exercise your, your, we're going to confiscate your dogs from, from you, you know, just give you a, hypothetical situation and say yeah because you know because people are saying they have to walk their dogs well you're not going to have any dogs to walk you see look at the violations will we roll over for that well in these communist countries no people absolutely did exactly that they did roll over time and time again in this balkanization this bolshevization
So there's always going to be, see, these are the pathological ones, like I said. And therefore, what we do now that we're pulling back and we're sitting at home, we got time to muse on things a little bit better. Muse on that. That if it was thousands of years ago, or it's going to be thousands of years from now, always in what we call civilization and society, you'll have these people who are looking over the, you know, who are looking for that kind of jackboot power. And they don't all wear swastikas on their arms and wear, you know, SS uniforms. They look like him. And they're always trying to tell you what to believe, what not to believe, right? It's what, what we want you to believe, and it was consensus, and then what we don't want you thinking and we don't want you believing. And therefore, you know, Wilhelm Reich would say that these are the people, well, he had two terms for this, you know, uh, emotional plague, and that they're just armored. And when he spoke, he wasn't speaking like Jung and Freud and these other people. He really did say that this is a structural issue in which you can actually see it on them, right? His psychology was very unusual because he actually said you can read the book by the cover and that you can tell you know that the, 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 this is the case with a with this or that person and then there's the social level of their armoring which is as we said the institutions for which they belong and even their need to participate in institutions uh remember remember that statement that um if you don't want to fight in wars or endorse wars you just don't go and fight Right. You yeah. don't, you don't, you know, you don't, if you don't want a corporation to come down, don't spend buying its rotten products. So in the same way, there is still already something pathological in them that they are needing to go and become part of some institution. So these cowards, right, who couldn't have the bravery, don't you see, of the maverick, they hate the maverick for that courage to stand outside the system because he's an outsider existentially. And his greatest enemy, the greatest enemy of the of the outsider, are people like that, right? Who couldn't live without the umbrella of the approval of the board, you know, and the big rubber stamp of you know, whatever it is, a doctorate, a, a PhD. They despise, right? You know, the Velikovsky types and whatever. You know, although Velikovsky had many degrees, but you know what I mean, right? The outsider that shakes them in their pants. They're living as they're walking down those nice polished corridors and sitting in that cubicle, right? And getting all the nice pats on the back from their, you know, uh, peers and their superiors. And then they want, they love the hierarchical power because there's somebody, there's a slave below me. Mm. But when they look at that individual sitting out there on the park bench, thinking the great thoughts, the Walter Russells, puttering about, right? You've got to understand the nature of the emotional plague, the deep envy, the the serpentine envy, right, of these uh, people. They have the IQ, but they have nothing else. And Reich exposed their fraud. Yeah, you got the big IQ because, you know, it's part of the emotional plague to overstimulate the frontal lobes. Mm. But that overstimulation of the frontal lobes in a bioenergetic sense is because it's understimulated the rest of your being, which is now under the armoring, you know, the lockdown. So the armored personality type, and Reich and Freud have different, you know, Everybody has their own different paradigm to speak about this. Freud would have probably called it the constitutional moral inferior. And I agree with that 100%, right? Jung would talk about how they're fucked up with their archetypes, right? You know what I mean? They, they've enslaved, either one of the archetypes has enslaved them, one of the dominant faculties, you know, intuition, thinking, feeling, and, 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 and emotion, whatever they are, right? One of them is dominant, like hyperinflated, ready for an explosion. These are balloon animals. There's but no I like balance. He's simple. There's no balance. They're completely out of balance, right? But they're out of balance in a society like Christian Moody would say is already abnormal. There's no, what did he say? There's no sense in being adjusted to an abnormal society. These are the ones who are adjusted to the abnormal society. And by definition, sitting in their corner in a state of absolute existential terror, in crippling fear of the truth, man, in misosophy, hatred of wisdom. Can you believe what they want for the human world? These are the ones who Blake said is the mind forge manacle makers. Disciples of Horizon, suits and ties, don't you know? Mm. Passes and tickets for everything, right? Red carpet all the way through because they have a high IQ. Yeah, Blake laughed at that because they lack everything else. And it's in bioenergetically, again, the state, when the frontal lobes are going in a person like this, their pathology is that that shuts down the right brain, that shuts down the aesthetic sensibility, that, sets, that, 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 that uh, kills off centroversion, which is real intelligence. It's emotion-based and feeling-based. Anybody with real empathy wouldn't go around, you see, uh, with a big stick, you know, uh, uh, and, and jackboots on trying to, you know, order people to stop thinking. 
which is what these people want to do. Those are people who are caught in an emotional plague. But the one thing, the difficult thing about that is this. I've said it in, in more of a humorous, uh, you know, other way where I say that, you know, the, the oblivious are oblivious of their obliviousness. But it's, although it's kind of humorous, it's actually quite true. These people's emotional plague, one of the things that comes in the capsule is you don't know you've got emotional plague. And you know something? You can never be told that you are. Only life crisis or a major personal tragedy might, might, right, get them to, you know, and most of the people I've known with emotional plague, even that doesn't change them. They're always, you're wrong. It's always somebody else's fault. So the, the chance of even a person with this emotional plague changing, even with, a you know, the classic Schopenhauer in life crisis, I'm afraid it's not, you know, on Hollywood you might get that. In real life, they just carry on as usual because they get the stabilizers of the world. If they do feel existential pain, it's like the clip we showed in Architects of Control, well, she's just taking the happy pills. What the fuck? She doesn't know she's not home anymore. Look at that big grin from here to here. Mm. The husband's sitting there going, fucking hell. That's not the woman I married, right? This is the state of, of affairs. They, they sign on for it. They sign on for the lie. And the emotional plague actually works retrospect, you know, re recursively that they, they think they're the most well people, the most armored person, you know, I don't feel, so I have no worries. It's extraordinary. But, but back to the main point, they envy, secretly envy the, the man who feels, the man mm. who has the empathy, the Solzhenitsyns, right? The Walter, right. The, the Walter Russells, the Wilhelm Reiches, and all the people we love are devoted to, the Ayn Rands, the Nathaniel Brandons. Those are alive. The dead person who's armored, armoring is just a synonym for, you know, psychic deadness. You're, they're zombified. They're petrified, actually. And uh, I'm afraid that they are the ones who are deeply pathological. <laughs> I couldn't agree more on that. Well, I got one more clip from a uh, professor here. And this is where I was in the chat and they came to the point where they were question period. And I waited the entire, um, the entire webinar. I was very respectful. I wasn't trying to go in and start a fuss. There were people in there trying to do that, but I don't believe in that. And at the end, I figured he had, he had this whole part presentation to actually define the word conspiracy because he's there defining conspiracy theory, but he's not even defining conspiracy. So we're already at a problem right away. So I asked the question and this is kind of how it plays out. Here we go. So I'm just going to pop on, uh, David, and I am going to kind of moderate the questions because there has been a ton of information in the chat box. So just in the interest of time, um, I'm going to just take uh, the questions that actually um, aren't statements so much, but are, are questions. So um, please start typing and I will moderate them. Okay. So great place to start. Dana's wondering if you can actually define the actual term conspiracy. I think this happened in the beginning of the presentation, but maybe you could do a quick review of that. Yes. Could I go back to that slide? That might be helpful to, to my fellow David if I, if I can do that. Yeah, he's Just, answering my question. And David, this is my, my personal definition as a term from a, a text. Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. So again, personal definition, not to be definitive in any way. This is helpful as a predicate for a conversation to, to have a, a definition. Conspiracy theory at the level of the individual is an organized and very seductive form of irrational thinking. And at the level of society, a highly contagious cultural phenomenon with pernicious and tangible consequences. In a, in a way, the whole, the whole presentation is kind of a, a, a definition, if you will, an elaborate definition. Okay, so you see what he did there? So I asked very specifically in the chat, please define the term conspiracy. I didn't say conspiracy theory. I saw the beginning of the presentation. He broke down, so and he gave it. Uh, it's a level of the individual organized seductive form of irrational thing. So all he did was give me opinion. He didn't give me the definition, which I thought he was a prestigious professor that understands how to have debate in a free society. But anyways, so here's, here's what I did. He didn't answer it. So let me just get my slides. Uh, where do I go with my slides? Let me jump ahead here. And I actually, I got a few quotes we're going to get into in a bit. Here we go. Okay. So he used the Oxford dictionary in the beginning to define a whole bunch of other terms. And um, he even used this in the CTV article and everything to try to go against conspiracy theorists. So 
I'm doing this on his behalf. It's the missing piece of his presentation where it says from the Oxford Dictionary, the action of conspiring combination of persons for an evil or unlawful purpose. The crime of conspiracy consists in the agreement of two or more persons to do an illegal act or to do an, a lawful act by unlawful means. Okay, so that's the definition I was looking for because if we got that definition, his entire presentation would be void because if we take that definition and then we start to look at examples and specifics, and yeah, of course, I'm the number one uh, person who would admit that there's all kinds of bogus crap in the conspiracy movement. That, that's always the way it's going to be. Every big subject that is, there is a core of truth there eventually. is always surrounded by a big circus. It's just the way it is. It's just humanity. There's different levels of IQ. There's different levels of, uh, of where people are at in their research. So there's, you're going to have, if it's, when you expose this to the general masses, you're going to have a lot of people coming in with a bunch of spurious stuff. I get it. But if you're going to, if you're going to try to debunk the entire thing as a general subject, you better do a better job than just giving opinion as a definition. So there's the real definition. So let's just ask the listeners right now. Do you believe that in the world, whether it be the lowest strata of society or the highest strata of society, that there's examples that you can think of, of where two or more people gather to plot, plan, and carry out an action that is illegal, unlawful, or dare I say, evil? Can any of you out there think of examples of where that might have happened in the past? Let's go through the mafia. Let's go through all these. And I got a few quotes I'm going to read for everybody. Got some reading for you. Government. But government. Yeah. So, Michael, go from there. Take away from there. Yeah, government and the, the institutions for which he belongs. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time. He should be going and dealing like a lot of these people. Clean thine own house. Right? Hippocratic oath. Doctor, heal thyself. He hasn't been able to find any cobwebs in academia. What a lovely life he must lead. He hasn't found any uh, lying, right, in the halls of the Congress, right? He hasn't found in the, in, the, in the psychiatry obscenity. I can put his fucking face in it, by the way, every single time. The great conspiracy tinfoil hat wearing Michael, right? I can put his face in conspiracies that it would take him lifetimes to solve. In the corridors of... Um, uh, like I say, neuroscience, politics, right? The humanities, wherever you want to look, philosophy, right? There's so much mess to clean up. Also, do you see that by those terms that he was using, he's against discernment. When you have a plethora of voices, a parliament of voices, how better to strengthen the immune system of the individual and the outsider? I'm happy for all the boogaloo crap that's out there because then I use my discernment to tell that it's boogaloo. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to be spoon fed like some four year old, right? Or four month year old, you know, four months old child, which I guess the people, half the audience he's talking to maybe are that feminized. Maybe they are that gullible and empty where they actually are crying out for that, you know, big spoon and the baby chair. What the hell do I know, right? But even when he had to define the word pernicious, like he had to pause and explain that, uh, to whom are you talking then? He's in the first in the first clip you played, he had to define the word pernicious. Why use it if you knew they're too dumb to understand it? And then now that you have used it, why are you pausing to explain to it? You know, so they can't get their own narrative right. His own arrogance there was very clearly, you know, showing this academic. But they are they don't want the, the, that discernment. That's what I'm angling people to sidelight the thing to see. They don't want you to be discerning. So the Parliament of Voices and some of the crazy shit out there, is it the Jews? Is it the, you know, the Catholics? Hey, maybe it fucking is, right? So I'm going to disprove it by going and studying it. I thought that was what we had sanctified by time for hundreds of years. Get it under the microscope. Let me see. That is what I want. Like Patrick McGowan said, I want the fists up in my face. I want the screaming and yell because actually what's taking place on the macro level is the development of discernment so you can't be fooled it's the same process that you know a, a police detective will know this guy's a psychopath and and this guy is telling me the truth it's it's there it's in the intuition right i pick it up because i've seen enough of them i've experienced many many crimes you know the hieroglyph in, in uh, egyptian for ration reason intelligence is a, is the hieroglyph it shows a picture of a heart we in the west haven't still got that the thinking is empathy, right? 
There's so much more intelligence in the right brain, you see, and even in the body, as I was saying earlier. These people don't have it, right? I'm telling you categorically. They could not get psychiatrists to diagnose me as pathological. But I can cite many psychologists who would prove that they're pathological, structurally and psychosomatically. So the power is with us. And no matter how many stones they throw, right? You see, see these. So basically, what I'm saying is, characterologically and uh, existentially, and and, and I can I can bring up a multiplicity of psychologists whose theories show that these people are the ones who are pathological. I'm not I'm not saying that facetiously. Viktor Frankl, right? Who who talked about the the quest for meaning as opposed to the will to power, the will to meaning. Erich Fromm, right? Sigmund Freud, Otto Rank. Melanie Klein, right? The list goes on and on and on. And we're still not even up to the level of, say, you know, wow, higher level people that, uh, you know, we could cite. To show that these people live within, one could call it, if you want, the problematic. And that the person that they despise, the outsider, so to speak, is living in what's known as the mysterious. And therefore, his comport he's a lover of, in fact, you can't even make the transition until a lot of empathy and a lot of love and care is awakened. In fact, that might even be the the thing that prevents one, you know, moving from one to the other. And so the person who doesn't have that omnidirectional sort of, uh, you know, uh, concern about life and the real meaning of existence, they stay within this problematic zone or paddock. While there, they have to do something. It's a very narrow place and you're avoiding a lot that is mysterious and brilliant and, 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 and vast. So what do I do in that little cage? Well, you pot there about, right, with some intellectual nonsense you know, a, a recapitulation. You're the little man, basically, right? But when you diagnose them through these means, you can see that these are the ones who have a pathological fear and hatred of the man who does ask those gateway questions. Always has, for time immemorial. You know, I can I can name the mythmongers of thousands of years ago. Akhenaten would be almost top of the list if he actually really wanted to get into it. But he's certainly not the only demigod who said, darn with these guys. Whereas everybody before he came, you know, was egalitarian. The, the ominous didn't even know what it was to suppress any other church or any other temple. That's why the Nile was filled with them. Do you know that all the stations on the Nile had temples of different gods and different religions? There's never been a more egalitarian society. That was uh, up to 5,000 years BC. You think we've made any progress? We've got more draconian and more draconian and more draconian as time goes by. All the stuff that you see today with this lockdown and a lot of things that are going on, you know, with it, are all part of, of a pathology of the masses. And all that the uh, guys upstairs do is co-opt that, our need for structure. Right? The Chinese have their version of it. It's called Bolshevism. But we have our version of it. It's called socialism. Right? And so there's a resonance set up, right, with the tyrant. Because the tyrant is gauging you like the pharaoh looking at a bunch of ants. And he says, if I put the honey over here, watch what happens, right? And if I put right. it over there, watch what happens, right? So this is how they play it. And communism and socialism are nothing more than fear of life. Another kind of armoring. Because as I said, you can have social armoring. And the social armoring is the urban environment in which you live, called a city or a town. And within the city and town, you have your structures and your edifices and your institutions, all, all built by the disciples of Horizon. Right. So the deep. So to, in order to see all my life, I've wanted to be able to understand, you know, the, the character logical traits of these obscene people who are gatekeepers for the establishment. But I didn't have a faintest idea, you know, where that road was going to lead me and what kind of theories he's talking about theories. The man doesn't even know what a conspiracy theory is. Wait till you hit him with a real thing. He'll be dazed for a year. Wheel in your William Blake's and your Wilhelm Reich's. He'll be fucking committing suicide. He'd be running for the nearest cliff and go, save me, save me. He doesn't even know what the word Illuminati. He thinks that's where the conspiracies start, start and stop. No, 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 no. That's the lowest level exposure. That's that's tin pot stuff. Right? The the real insight of, of the, you know the outsider is to see into what consciousness is all about, the anatomy of that. That, that that allows all people, you see, to be under any form of tyranny, and that's trauma. So what do we know about trauma, right? Like I said, now it takes you, you know, because that becomes an incredible study that, you know, and, and also a breaking out, how you deal then with the trauma. We'll be dealing with that on Sunday on the podcast, right? But we've dealt with it a lot of other times before. So until, so say even if this man was right, 
and and he had a point or two you know we're saying we've got to stop this thinking we've got to stop this expansion as if you really could anyway right because he's claiming it's got dangers in a psychological age he would be able to self-reflect to say why are you threatened by it but in the anti-psychological age he would never ask that question nor would he allow you to ask it to him therefore there's no conversation right so you can bring up then reams of evidence you can wheel into the court filing cabinets that would fill the you know, empire state building and it would nothing would change i've learned it in my own career many times i don't know why i've even got this question because i have sources all the time but sometimes you know you get the odd spurious person to go where's your sources you know where, where's your citations and you know here's the weird thing i learned through 21 years now of active you know public uh, appearances even when you offer those sources they act like they don't even exist yeah exactly so that's when i knew there's emotional play oh believe me it's never good enough i can't force this it's never good enough in fact they don't even bother with it they don't read I, it and yeah. i understand they're watching it i go well the source is actually you know it's uh rupert, rupert sheldrake you know or the discoveries of bruce lipton you know on the photonic energy of the cell or, whatever. or it's michael cremo who tells you we're four million years old you know they fucking you might as well not even have said it doesn't that expose then that person's complete duplicity that they're impervious to truth they're impervious to argument well that's exactly the kind of person who signed on for 2000 years to christianity it's exactly the si uh, type of uh, moronic uh, you know fossilized creature armored creature that signs on for radical ismal right and all the way down the line so to diagnose then what's in their consciousness is what the outsider really ultimately needs to become. He needs to be a psychologist. He needs to take seriously psychology with the awareness that you cannot approach the diseased person with psychology because that person will not ask the question themselves, why have I got a problem with this? Why do I feel affronted by the fact that there's conspiracy people out there? What is it that threatens me? That kind of thinking has never entered these minds. They have high IQ, so they've you know they've got intelligence to get jump through a few hoops and get a pat on the back and get a fucking PhD. Doesn't mean a thing to me, right? The hieroglyph, Egyptian hieroglyph for thinking is the heart. That's where I come from, right? And I say to them, you failed. You haven't even got off the fucking freshman level yet, right? And you take it from there. They will. They're impervious to asking about their own character and why they should find this irritating. And they will not brook anyone enunciating it to them or trying to engage them this way. I'm all too familiar with people like that. And those people run in several directions. You know, if you want to really get into the whole map of it, we're not going to do that, but a couple of points. That kind of personality type that is a pathological hatred of wisdom and self-reflection and what I call centroversion after Erich Newman, they run in a couple of directions. Three will mention religion, government, and academia i'll leave everybody else to dot connect that that's why you've been meeting the things that you're meeting at the front of the class that's why your children are coming out ignorant or worse that's why your religion just won't go away and is just chock-a-block full of pedophiles and god knows what else worse right or the psychiatry right whatever but the hedonic person who's in a complete evasion of the self let's just call it that and that's what these people are this is where they go those are the institutions that have been built to house them so when they come out of the woodwork you know and start babbling all this stuff you know like trying to naysay conspiracy theory and all and as you caught them they don't even properly right define the term right they, they play the chicanery they move the goalposts all the time and as i said even when you do present evidence they just exact they just carry on as if you never even did that and that's right. your moment to take that photograph that's when you take the polaroid going you're demented you are absolutely somebody that i do not want to have anything to do with and i will teach my audience to have nothing to do with you because you did not lift up that evidence study it and go is that john adams is that you know is that the fucking duke of brunswick is that washington is that the dean of harvard is that one of the top generals Oh my God, I better think about this. Well, they don't. Carol so Quigley. I've learned that after wheeling, manually wheeling in, right, which I did once upon a time, all of this evidence and nothing, nothing changes. Nothing changes in their mentality. I said, oh my God, 
get me away from here. Get me away from these types. And I, I, I know that became part of my social message as well. Don't lose any sleep over these people. Use psychology, right? See if those people are self-reflexive. -reflect, uh, if they've even addressed why they find this to be pernicious, what is their stance? You'll find that they can't even articulate it. Well, I can. It's demagoguery. You've got the suit and tie on. You've got the badge. That's all you need to be a general marching up and down and ordering everybody else around. It's pure demagoguery. That's the answer. You don't have any genuine, human, empathic or humanistic uh, cause, right, or raison d'etre to go out and do this because there's lots of humanitarians out there and they never bother. The leading people, even, even the leading materialists, don't really go and make a big deal about this. They may not like it, and that's their right. But they don't go and get on a platform any more than anybody else. And as I said, technically speaking, there's not enough mess in the corridors of academia, mate, Mr. Black, for you to go and you know be worried about what we're doing over here, the, our little our little pad. There's such a small demographic. That's a that's a that's a that's a a monster. That is a tyrant in plain sight. And you have to be able to, like we're doing right now, prove that. We have. Yeah, I mean you fully. <laughs> Exactly. Bully at this, tactics. It is bully tactics. And at this stage, you've, uh, you've already completely decimated this argument. But for uh, the sake of redundancy or just even showing some illustrations, I've got some more slides and just things that we can catch people on. Because you got to remember, what this professor represents is the institutionalized academic version of the people you're going to meet in the street especially the people that watch all of their information from the media and they get all of their info from these people. These are their priests. These are the people that stand in and reassure them that that person, that's the outsider that's trying to help you stretch your thinking and, 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 and maybe even cause you some discomfort in looking at facts that we'd rather not confront. That, per that person will go away. I'm coming in to protect you from those people and from that conversation. We don't want to have that conversation. These people, and there's so many people that are just waiting for someone to come out and go, oh my God, thank goodness that David, David and Michael are wrong and all these other people and Anthony Sutton's wrong and Geo Griffin's wrong. Thank God they're wrong because, uh, man, I was really starting to get freaked out about this, this conspiracy thing. And, and remember that, that's another thing they try to do is say, oh, you're just fear mongering, you're just scaring people and all that. And it's like, no, the, we're not saying there's no danger. See, they're scaring you with one thing, which is go wear masks, gloves and bubble wrap your kids and don't ever look at another human being again, okay? And then we're saying, oh, well, you know what? That's all a lie. That's actually not the, that's not the right way to deal with health. There's other experts that have a different opinion. And because we're saying that, people don't get relieved from one fear and go, oh, gee, thanks, Dave. I guess I don't have to lose my business. I guess I don't have to hand sanitize every 1.2 seconds. Um, I, can, I can live my life a little bit more normal and there's ways to boost my immune system. Thank you for freeing me from this lie. Nope. It's you're scaring me because now I have to confront the fact that I was lied to by the institutions, by the media, by the people with all the money. And now I have to think for myself and that's scary as hell. Right. And that's what people are really afraid of. So bear with me here. I'm going to go through some of the slides and I got some quotes. I'm going to reference a few things. And, um, and Michael, please let me know. I know I'm keeping you. Uh, you've spent 90 minutes with me. If you got to take off, mate, you just let me know anytime. Um, oh, no, no, more than welcome. Okay. Very important. Let's do this. All right. Very good. So here we go. He has this slide where he says, conspiracy theories, logical fallacies. Okay, so let's just dismiss the logical fallacy he presented by not even defining the term. Let's put that aside for a second. So he says this, if we examine the logical structure of any conspiracy theories, we see any number of logical fallacies as core features of such theories. So right away, we're getting a general diagnosis here and we're putting everything into one basket. So number one is confirmation bias. Seeking and selecting information that conforms to your pre-existing ideas about something and avoiding or rejecting information that contradicts them. Yeah, so that argument can be flipped the other way as well. So there's no real truth there. So number two, non-falsifiability. Premises that cannot be disproven because they are not open to challenge by observation, experiment, or contrary evidence. That's just a false. That's just a lie is what that number two is. It's just a lie. Michael already illustrated that. Number three. Logical circularity or question begging, referring back to your own premises as evidence for your argument rather than allowing those premises to be open to critique. Jesus, man, this guy's actually giving me the blueprint for how to debunk him, crying out loud. Next, a refusal of Occam's razor. And in the presentation, this guy actually said out loud, this is my favorite one of all. So this was his big 
bazooka blast in the face of all the conspiracy theorists was a refusal of Occam's razor. And Occam's razor is the principle in logic that all things being equal, the simplest explanation for something is often the right one. And let me just come back real quick here because the simplest argument, I had a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door one time and they had their little recruitment uh, system going where they had the, the older guy and then they had this young like 16 year old girl that he, they're grooming for the, to be the next Jehovah's Witnesses. And when well, they came up to the door and I remember actually being in the mood to have a conversation. So I said, hey, you guys want to, let's go sit down, we'll have a coffee, we'll talk about things, I'll share some info, you'll share some info. And right away, it was the elder gentleman that said, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to show you the book. We're going to show you the thing. And then, you know, that's it. And I said, well, which book? You know, how do I know that your book is different than the Mormons versus the Bible versus how many translations of the Bible? How do I know what's true? I mean, you're selling me on a religion, man. You got to give me a something. And, and right away, this young girl said something that struck with, it stuck with me. And she said, but isn't it beautiful? And she opened up the book and she said, look, it's so simple. It's so simple. That's what's true about it is how simple it is. So she essentially gave me the Occam's, Occam's razor argument to justify me converting to Jehovah's Witnessism, whatever it is called. And I just yeah. looked at her and I said, I, it just came out of my mouth. I didn't mean to insult her, but I just kind of said, well, could it be simple so that it can be read by simple-minded people? Like simple Simon, the one Sim talking to you? Right, yeah, simple right. Simple for and her. It's simple for her. And I'm like, and I understand, like, you're young, you're, you're, you've got, and I don't want to offend you. I'm not trying to change you or anything like that. But just think about that statement. Simplicity is truth. Well, okay. Yeah. What about what? We quantum need science. Bird. Right, exactly. And so here I went Which to. You can contradict in two seconds since all the <laughs> inventions of, of science, complex telescopes, microscopes, looks pretty complex to me. And yet our world wouldn't exist without it, would it? Exactly. But they're debunking. See, so they're actually attacking things. That girl was actually attacking something, trying to trying to exalt simplicity, which in another sense could be done. But in this sense, I mm. prefer the simplicity. I'm against complexity. Sorry, got nothing to talk about. Bye. Right, and that's pretty much how that conversation your ended. Your own brain. If I opened, the, if I smashed your skull and took out your brain, it looks pretty complex to me, doesn't it? Well, Look exactly. At the asinine level of these people to debunk con complexity and sell your religion based on it's simple. Yeah, there's black and white pictures in it, you know? Yeah, what kind of simple are we talking about? Are we talking about the simplicity of, uh, of nature, but there's complexity. also complexity, right? Like there, it's simple and complex. So there's both simplicity and right. complexity. It's not just one thing. Not there you go. That. You're trying to get my mind in a pretty compartment. But anyways, just to validate it, because you've already, but if, if I went to a science blog, I went to scienceblog.com. I found a scientist there. Um, I'll put a link below where he was actually debunking Occam's razor as the most effective tool in science. And he says this, Occam's razor is actually a vestigial remnant of medieval science. It is literally a historical artifact. William of Ockman, Occam employed this principle in his own 13th century work on divine omnipotence and other topics, resistant and scientific methods, etc. The continuing use of Parsimony in modern science is an atavistic practice equivalent to a cardiologist resorting to bloodletting when heart medication doesn't work. And then he said, theories with the fewest assumptions are often preferred to those posting, positing more heuristic, often called Occam's razor. This kind of argument has been used on both sides of the creationism evolution debate um, and is uh, an argument against religion. Simple theories have many advantages. They are often falsifiable or motivate various predictions and can be easily communicated as well as widely understood. But there are numerous reasons to suspect that this simple theory of theories is itself fundamentally misguided. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the field of physics, the science of attempting to uncover the fundamental laws giving rise to reality. The history of physics is like a trip down the rabbit hole. The elegance and simplicity of Newtonian physics has been incrementally replaced by more and more complex theories, such as quantum theory. Sure. Um, and he keeps going and he breaks all that down. So just, you know, there's another scientist that's coming to say, hold on a minute. If we start getting into physics and quantum theory and all these other theories, and then as you were saying, even mechanical theory, and, and into, there's nothing simple about it, man. Okay, and so that's where sophistry can actually enter in. There's been many philosophers that have warned us about this, that in one sense, we can see that there's a simplistic nature to things, and maybe you have to present things simplistically to people, but you'll never get to the truth. You'll just get an introduction to a thing. 
to get to the truth, especially when that truth has been obscured by lies and misinformation and having people locked up in dungeons and burned at the stake. You know, what happened to Giordano Bruno? Was his argument simple? No, it was pretty complex because he was he was refuting the Vatican's argument that, you know, the earth is flat and, and the, we're, we don't, you know, there's no other planets in the universe. We're alone and everything. He comes out and goes, no, I think it's actually the other way around. They're like, yeah, okay, we're going to burn you at the stake. You're too complex, man. And you're going to ruffle the feathers of all the simplistic little villagers that we need to keep controlled. What are you doing, man? That's the history of people. Is Nikola Tesla's theory is simple? Even Einstein, whatever, any of them, none of it's simple, right? So I just wanted to quickly debunk that. All right. And then we'll jump back into it. Go ahead. That's the infantilization. A lot of people want us to not have gone down the roads that we've gone down scientifically, philosophically. There's people who are, you know, Luddites who want us to go backwards. Right. And even from my own science, martial art, I call it a scientific art of studying martial arts. You know, in a way you're pursuing both and there's nothing simple. Like I could, I could explain a simple concept to you in, in breathing, in movement in stretching in punching, whatever I could explain the concept and logically you go, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's, it makes rational sense, but do it, show me, you can do it and do it under different pressures. Do it when, when you got woken up in the bed at night, and someone's trying to, you know, steal your shit, do it, you know, do it under extreme circumstances. You won't be able to, cause it isn't simple. It actually takes years and years and years and years of breaking down old programming and installing new programming. And it's, it's, it's not simple at all. That process, if it was simple, it'd be like the matrix where they just plug you and now I know jujitsu. It's not like that. And by telling people to live that simple life, you're keeping them simple minded. You're keeping them dumbed down and you're taking away the process of achieving knowledge. Knowledge isn't just something you get. Knowledge is earned through Mm -hmm. the battle of dealing with yourself and then questioning. And even what we're doing right now, there's nothing simple about taking a very prestigious professor, although he's made it pretty easy and, and dissecting it and creating it and everything else or disseminating a different idea or anything else, you know? And the uh, good, good point, because remember, if he really, if he really was backing what he's saying, he would do then what's known as phenomenology. He'd actually go to us and find out what it is we do, which he hasn't bothered doing. But there's been no experiment. It's just words. And remember, a lot of this, what we're seeing these people do is a language game that they're playing, actually. That's why he hasn't bothered right. experimenting or really, he's just giving an opinion. And the words carry weight. These key words, you know, that uh, they use, these talismanic terms like conspiracy theorists and all. So don't forget the language game that's being played with these people. And also the media displays nothing but language games. Mm. Uh, when I said that these people have low IQs, I meant it, right? That the journalist types, they play language games. When I call this guy a sophist, when we start begin, you know, started discussing this, I meant that too. They're sophists, so they play with words and terms, right? To get, you know, they, they don't deal with real empathy in the real world at all. See, let, let's put it this way. If he dealt with the real world, based on what you just said about physical fact, if he dealt with the real world that he is claiming to know a lot about, he would come and find out a couple of extraordinary things. He's into science. I'll give you some science equations. The grueling, long, painstaking process that people like myself have done over the life to eliminate the untrue, to find the truth, he would have to be phenomenologically noting that that is, in fact, what myself and others have done. What's pathological about that? So if he had come stepped into our world and really found out phenomenologically what, how a conspiracy person thinks most of them, the ones who are really diligent, the ones who've written books and so on, you will find extraordinary self-discipline, extraordinary application of deconstructive thought, apophatic thought, scientific process, rationality, painstaking elimination of the untrue and so on. They're never going to talk about that. They're never going to credit you. And then, I'll apply some more science. It is a well-known fact that this person could not deny that all psychopathic types have a pathological hatred of truth, morality, and justice. Mm. It's based on, like I said, turning it back on them. They don't have the empathy, but they have all of those things. So that's the patho- that's that is a that those are the textbook definitions of a pathological type. They have no time for empathy. They blame everybody all the time. Right. And that's where you can see traces of it in that person where he's just going to blame and blame and blame and have done no experimentation, no dialogue, no jumping phenomenologically into that person's life and saying, if I really want to know my enemy, I must write my book. I must write the biography of that person. Let me find out. Right. What that person's all about. We had a guest on just last week who emphasized this, Stephen Mm -hmm. Fox. Yeah. 
Amazing if I show. really want to know somebody, let me step into their shoes and live one day, you know, like the Indian thing. Let me walk in their moccasins for a couple of miles. Well, these, these so-called experts are not experts in anything, right? Except deceiving people, right? And lowering the, you know, every time they speak, they subtract from the, the you know, the level of human intelligence. And that's exactly right. They know the least about that which matters most to people. And they're out of sync with even what the, the trends are in, the, in, in terms of the world which is moving ever toward, you know, more unveiling, more uh, disclosure, uh, and certainly uh, moving way into skepticism about the establishments. Mm. So you could respond to him and say, what kind of phenomenological research have you done? Because if you did it, you would be flummoxed. You would not even bother, you know, with this crusade that you're on, because you discover that temporally speaking, and in the movement of these minds, incredible research take stanton evans take gia griffin take john stormer take richard perloff uh james perloff and a whole list of eminent people i could speak about i wouldn't even like to fathom how they managed to gather all of this information through their life and the pain and the struggle and they were ordinary school teachers they were ordinary businessmen right but they turned their wits to this he said robert welch the head of the john birch society whatever so all of these eminent people, are you really going to try and tell me? And as I said, we've just already established it goes up to the presidential level. Are you going to tell me that people of this, you know, uh, people like that are really are just wasting their time? That's the that's the arrogance that you have. Just because the other side hasn't stated its case brings things to people and leaves them with the freedom to walk away if they want to walk away and say okay call me you call me all names i didn't call you here i didn't stop you here we didn't force the tickets to convention conventions into your hands you came of your own free will and you can leave of your own free will that's the way the whole conspiracy movement is run nobody's enforcing anything so when they damn it when they demonize it they are the ones who are the you know the, the inquisitioners and that should be really really clear to people right now yeah. and then again as i said what do they know about the process that Michael says Tassarin is one example has gone through? And how could they then, after seeing even a, you know, a small uh, snippet or, yeah, how could they uh, ever formulate any, you know, theory that I was a danger to society or a fear monger? They are the fear mongers. They are the dispensers of fear. They are the ones who we are trying to unslave ourselves from, right? Their paradigms. But just because they've got that big academic, uh, you know, institution behind them, the greatest crimes against knowledge, wisdom, and justice are done. And I'm, I'm afraid to say, just like Joel Bacan, he wrote that book, The Corporation, uh, showing that corporations can be pathological and psychopathic. It's already been established, folks. Mr. Black, it has already been established that most corporations in this world, especially the kind of ones we've got now, not the kind of ran, the ones that Rand would build, and are totally sustainable no we are wall-to-wall -wall pathological you know with corporations and the individuals who who make them up and you are part of one of them so we're already on higher pedestals than you mate because you belong to one of them and i don't see you doing anything to reform your high your church of high priests i'd have respect for you if you did yeah Absolutely. Yeah, we don't have to agree on everything, but man, this is just some basic stuff that we're catching them on here. So let's continue. Uh, that's brilliant, by the way. So what do you go? Uh, so we did Occam's Razor. Number five, post hoc ergo proper hoc fallacy. This is like logical fallacy. Believing that because one thing precedes another in time, it therefore must have caused the second thing to happen. <laughs> this guy is diagnosing himself. It's hilarious. Number six, a reflexive distrust of legitimate authority and expertise. A reflexive distrust. Oh, we're well, on to something now. Here we go. So he goes, this is, a, this is not a logical fallacy as such, but a condition for those indicated above. While a degree of caution and skepticism relating to legitimate authority, example, government, science, and to um, expertise in general is reasonable, example, professors such and so on such skepticism should be accountable to and persuadable by facts and logic and not be complete automatic and extreme so but you didn't even right, so define the term no no he, he's defining uh, the facts they'll decide what is the fact like i told right. you when you bring right. them the facts they'll they'll just use this uh 
big stick to say that's not a fact, right? So, you know, John Allegro was, like I said, Jed Dead Sea Scrolls, told you all about it, exposed all the frauds of the Catholic Church, delaying for 50 years the publication. He scrubbed. Nobody reads him, right? And yet everything he said was true. You see? So they are the authorities. It's just as simple as that. It's nothing more than uh, Himmler could have written that. What the fuck? Heinrich Himmler could have written that. I'm not hearing you. you. You're are you muted? Sorry, I was muted. OK, good. So here we go. Uh, so to back that up, let's go to Senator Gary Allen for a quick second. This book everybody should have, especially in the world we're living in right now. It's very, very important to go back and read it. And um, I just wanted to highlight a few statements where he says, those who believe that major world events result from planning are laughed at for believing in the conspiracy theory of history. Of course, no one in this modern day and age really believes in the conspiracy theory of history, except those who've actually taken the time to study the subject. When you think about it, there are really only two theories of history. Either things happen by accident, neither planned nor caused by anybody, or they happen because they are planned and somebody causes them to happen. In reality, it is the accidental theory of history preached in the unhallowed halls of the Ivy League which should be ridiculed. Otherwise, why does every recent administration, and he's talking in his time here, make the mistakes or the same mistakes as the previous ones? Why do they repeat the errors of the past which produce inflation, depressions, and war? Why does our State Department stumble from one communist aiding blunder to another? If you believe it is all an accident or the result of mysterious and unexplicable tides of history, you will be regarded as an intellectual who understands that we live in a complex world. If you believe that something like 32,496 consecutive coincidences over the past 40 years stretches the law of averages a bit, then you're a kook. And then this is to go specifically into his critique of these um, scholars and mass media columnists. This is very important. It's a bit long, but bear with me here. He says, why is it that virtually all reputable scholars and mass media columnists and commentators reject the cause and effect or conspiratorial theory of history? Primarily, most scholars follow the crowd in the academic world, just as most women follow fashions. To buck the tide means social and professional ostracism, which is exactly what happens to people like that. The same is true of the mass media. While professors and pontificators profess to be tolerant and broad-minded, in practice, it's strictly a one-way street with all traffic flowing left. A Maoist can be tolerated by liberals of ivory tower land or by the establishment's media pundits, but to be a conservative and a conservative who propounds a conspiratorial view is absolutely verboten. Secondly, these people have over the years acquired a strong vested emotional interest in their own errors. So he's highlighting what you're saying there, Michael. Their intellects and egos are totally committed to the accidental theory. Most people are highly reluctant to admit that they have been conned or have shown poor judgment. To inspect the evidence of the existence of a conspiracy guiding our political destiny from behind the scenes would force many of these people to repudiate a lifetime of accumulated opinions. It takes a person with strong character indeed to face the facts and admit he's been wrong, even if it was because he was uninformed. Politicians and quote-unquote intellectuals are attracted to the concept that events are propelled by some mysterious tide of history or happen by accident. By this reasoning, they hope to escape the blame when things go wrong. Most intellectuals, pseudo or otherwise, deal with the conspiratorial theory of history simply by ignoring it. They never attempt to refute the actual evidence because it can't be refuted. And if and when the silent treatment doesn't work, these objective scholars and mass media opinion molders resort to personal attacks, ridicule, and satire. I'd also add uh, censorship in there. The personal attacks tend to divert attention from the facts which an author or speaker is trying to expose. The idea is to force the person exposing the conspiracy to stop the exposure and spend his time and effort instead defending himself. However, the most effective weapons used against the conspiratorial theory of history are ridicule and satire. These extremely potent weapons can be cleverly used to avoid any honest attempt at refuting the facts. And, this, and there's less reason for the establishment now to have that satire, that scoffing, because of current events. So they, mm. it's measurable as well. Sometimes they get their way because, you know, there's not much happening in the world and everything looks normal. 
or, you know, uh, there's no enemy on the horizon. And then there's times like this. And so they're very, they get more worried. This guy's popped up out of the blue, probably because, you know, their scale is way, way down right now. And people are, you know, not scoffing at the conspiracy theorists anymore. But remember that Lloyd Pye book, Everything You Know Is Wrong? That's it, mate. That's what it's all about. I don't want to have jumped through all those hoops like some dog looking for a bone. Right? And then be told when I'm 20, 30, 40, and 50, everything you know is wrong. And yet, that is falsifiable. See, he's talking about the unfalsifiable. It is a fact that you could that everything you know could be wrong. And it's because that is such a, a fact that like a soldier can put your fucking head in it. That is their reaction. When they say it can't be falsifiable, it, this is just a bogus argument. The fact that they are worried about it is that you can prove it. Like Gary Allen is saying, it can be substantiated. It cannot be refuted. That is what they're real. You've uncovered their ego. You've uncovered their mask at that point. That when a Solzhenitsyn speaks, when a Gary Allen speaks, when a such and such speak, doesn't mean they're error free. That that would be far too, I, I would never say that. Of course, yeah. Right? I'm not building you know statues to these people. It's about a critiquing. But since great, you know, the work, the preponderance of the time and the energy that they put in, and the weight, a, a good conspiracy theorist weighs up what they're what they're thinking about and weighs it for many years sometimes. It's because it is provable, it is solid, and it is falsifiable. If you, but the trouble is when they come to falsify it, they find that they're on the weak ground, so they call it unfalsifiable. You've handed me something that can't be falsified, bogus argument. And also remember, I told you if they come into our world phenomenologically. What do you think Unslaved is? What do you think we have built a platform, you and I, specifically to get away from the bogus motherfuckers out there who've contaminated this movement? I've said it about 100,000 times that this movement is infested with a bunch of people who are losers. The, a phenomenological crit critic would go, I honor you for that, Michael. So you're off our list because you've actually, you addressed some of the same stuff we've done and you didn't get prompting from us. You're cleaning in-house, which I actually, I should be doing back in my academic you know, circle, but never, you know, forget that. You have done a great deal within your circle as a conspiracy theorist to accuse, right? And to set the bar quite high. Your own slave turns out to be that. If I was objective, I'd admit that. You guys made this platform so that you could actually make sure that you had the time, the space, right? To speak so that you wouldn't be misunderstood. That's all enslaved. If you need a mission statement, it's because knowing the kind of genre that we're in, knowing that it has certain pitfalls, we went and spent money and time and energy, right? To, and also the energy to make the content so high, bro, for a specific group of audience. Why? That's all, again, phenomenologically on our side. Because we are already acknowledging. They, we don't need this Mr. Black to tell us that the movement has got some spurious concepts and people in it. We've already cleaned house. We've already acknowledged that. And a great deal of our energy, for which you're not crediting, crediting us, which is to your discredit then, is so that when we're reading from, when we are doing our work, when we're talking about these scholars and presenting content, it is as pristine as we, with our limited resources, can get it. Is that guy going to come and concede? He's talking about all the falsifiability and all these big words. Is he doing anything phenomenological to give credit where credit is due? The answer is no. So again, we're dealing with a, a, a you know a, a, a Himmler. We're dealing with a strutting sergeant major clipboard wielding, right? Dictator, tyrant, petty tyrant, little man, as Reich would have always called him. And you think Gary Allen's going at them? We like the book, Listen, Little Man, yeah. and read that from That's Wilhelm Reich. Juggernaut. And we will have no problem. As I said, if one of you know the psychology, you can diagnose these people exactly who they are. And Wilhelm Reich is Wilhelm Reich, not this little ponce from some institution. As I said, go to the intellects that tower above these people who, who created paradigms that if you ever even acknowledge, if, even if you implemented 40%, no, let's even be more general, 10% of Wilhelm Reich's theories, disease would be unknown in the world. Bring me that intellect. Like Anthony John West said, I would rather learn, right, the meaning of life from the builders of the Temple of Luxor than the creators of the atom bomb. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. Bring me the man who can dispense all disease for all time in this world, or a Nikola Tesla. And why did he die on the floor of a gulag and a stockade and a prison? Bring me that man and I will bow before his feet. Not these posers, these pseudo-intellects, these wannabe critics of something that's so monumental 
How dare they? Well, that's that posturing. They have to you know, pose in front of the mirror to make themselves look like the Teslas and the Reichs that they're never going to be. Right? But these are the people who, by, by holding those chairs and positions, then the great man can't sit there. Don't you see that the army of flunkies, an army of pseudo, right, scholars and all the institutions of the world, for every one of them, there's a greater man, there's a Walter Russell that isn't in that seat. You, you don't cry about it, I do. Where's the Khalil Gibrans? Where's the great minds? Where's the Solzhenitsyns? They're Steiner. out in the fucking hallway, that's what. And so, oh, Rudolf Steiner and millions of others we could mention. For every one of these jackasses that occupy a seat in the prestigious colleges of the world, saluting their jackass Derrida's. Have you any have a conscience of the mighty names and the mighty souls that have come to this planet? The enlightened ones, the golden ones, the shining ones that are not given what is needed? And they want to, they want to then gatekeep that reality? I'll burn that reality down. We'll do whatever we can to, 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 to combat it. Where's your Emanuel Velikovsky's? Your Cummins Beaumont's? The people I spent a lifetime trying to bring to the public eye. Didn't say they were all perfect. Didn't say you have to not believe them as authorities. But use your wits, for goodness sake, your common sense and your empathy to, to judge and understand what is truth. And what Alan is saying there is perfectly right, because being an eminent man, he came up against it. He, the one thing is like, never take on the cause of the oppressed unless you want to meet the oppressor. So if these people were to credit us at all, they go, dude, rather than being a bunch of paranoics and freaks, you're taking on government. Turn around so I can pat you on the back. I have never done that one day in my life. I'm an institution man. I'm an organization man. I salute the company. You little buggers are out there fucking, you know, th throwing bricks where they're, de where they're deserved. If you, you, know, you saw the bigger picture, because what are we really doing? Going after pedophile priests and all the things that we do? There's something wrong in that? This guy needs to get his clipboard out. I'll give him a couple of pointers. What is it that the people, what, why doesn't he list what actual conspiracy people do? He said, I'm not going to take on any individual cases. Fucking right, you're not. Take on Ted Gunderson. Right? I'll put you, I'll, I'll give you a guy you can go after. Ted Gunderson, you know the back crazy one? Yeah. You know the one who used to turn up where children have been massacred and torn to pieces in satanic rituals? You know that fucking nutter? Oh, I take him on, sure. Or FBI Senator John director. DeCamp that exposed worldwide. Yeah. And other people have exposed worldwide child pornography rings and whatever. Go talk to the Queen of Sweden or the Queen of Denmark, whichever it was. I can't remember, right? Go talk to John DeCamp, Senator John DeCamp. My God, what scurrilous flunkies these people are. List all the things that these people actually do phenomenologically and see if your audience now goes, I don't see a red check mark there. I'm, all, I'm for all of that. Poisonous food, fluorescent lights, chemtrails, mercury in the teeth, heavy metals in the fucking vaccinations, circumcision of the children. Shall I go on? Did this man dutifully as an academic list all the things that these bat crazy fucking people do? Telling you watch out for subliminals and television. Watch out for all the toxins in the products. And I could go on. The synthetic clothes, right? Where is there no conspiracy? For fuck's sake. The electricity you're using is bollocks. Wheel in Walter Russell. Take him on. Oh, but it was only... See, I've got a, I got a weird tinfoil hat philosophy. If the first two men in America had their books burned, I want to read those books. Lock me up. <laughs> no kidding. If, Walter, uh, if Nikola Tesla was the second man to have his books burned in free America, and Wilhelm Reich was the first man to have all his cabinet seized, by the federal government, all his books actually burned. Now, I'm not making this facetious or, you know, this is not metaphor. This is an actual fact. I'm the kind of person who goes, I wonder what was in those books. Then you start adding Max Gerson, Raymond Royal Rife, Nick, you know, all the rest of them, all purged, all prevented, all under arrest, all stopped from healing people. I want to know what their source of, I, I'm now interested in what to do. It doesn't mean that I don't later find out that some of it was bollocks or bogus or whatever, but I now want to find out what that science is. That is a creative masculine mind. That's what makes a Giordano Bruno. But the sheep that they want, you know, must just digest the filth that a Soros or a Bill Gates or a fucking Zuckerberg or whatever is handing you down. People are so armored, you can... It's right on their bloody faces, the emotional plague, for fuck's sake. It's not that hard. Right? 
And yet, yeah, these are the people who are ruling our world. And in my journey to look at why that is, I've had to address you know, the questions of why the collective even allows it to happen. And we're not going to go into that now, but there's many multiple areas of which you have to go, and most of them are psychological. And that's the kind of thing that they're afraid of. They don't want leaders like that. And they don't want the men I have mentioned who are men of great genius, these Victor Schauburgers, right? The ones who can show you how to make electricity from a fucking water, a stream outside your garden. Okay, that's what they don't want. They don't want men who are going to really set you free. That's, man, that's spot on, brother. That was, there's so much in there. You got me all riled up. That's good because there's so much to dissect in that. That's the sound of freedom, ladies and gentlemen. And if this, if this people, if this guy and any of your friends or your family or whoever these people are that are just going to shout you down for questioning things, if there's no conspiracy in the world, can somebody, you touched on it a little bit, Michael, but here we go. Here's some real fucking stats for you. Can somebody tell me how it's possible that 5 million, they estimate between 2 to 5 million children get pulled into the utter depths of hell every single year and are sold into actual slavery for organ harvesting, for sexual whatever the fucks, for all kinds of other things. And that's official numbers, folks. Official numbers. You can go look them up. This isn't even counting how big this really sh this rabbit hole really goes if you want to get into it. Two million. Let's just go with the, the, the smallest number. Two million. Everybody's worried about the deaths of probably what's going to turn out to be less than 100,000 people, which there's 650,000 people that die every year from influenza. You want to talk COVID conspiracy? How about this? 100,000 people die. Or even let's just go with their numbers, which are all conflated. And now 160 experts are coming out to debate it. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, 350,000 people died from this. Okay. Two million children go missing and are sold into sex slavery every year. That kind of an operation globally is incapable of existing unless there is some kind of conspiracy at the highest levels of government. It's impossible. They can find you if you don't go pay your taxes. They can shut your Facebook account down if you post something about not wanting to conform to whatever the new language police have said you have to say. They can shut down my YouTube channel and find you just like that. They're about to inject you with quantum dots and nano-sized particles so they can track your fucking lung capacity and your body temperature. They're going to install biometric face scanning masks on all the police so they can read your fucking, it's going to be like Robocop. Okay, they can find you anywhere you want to go if you avoid their system, but they can't lock up the motherfuckers who are taking children off the street in the millions around the world and organizing with the highest people in the land, princes, dukes, Epsteins. You want to, come on, give me a break. There's no conspiracy. How about we talk about that? Let's get into the facts of that. And if you think that's just some low level uh, mafia MS-13 shit, that would not be able to exist unless it was allowed to exist. It's impossible to come to any other kind of conclusion because it's still happening and we didn't lock the world down and close all the playgrounds for that. Do you know, you're right. Do you know that you can prove conspiracy in one line? Up until now, and probably even still, there is no actual federal law to track children, missing children over state lines. But they've yeah. got it for knives and forks. Oh, for fuck's sake. Seriously? If I steal a car or I steal some cutlery, silver cutlery, the federal law says, right, you will not be prosecuted federally when we track you down. It's a federal offense. Abducting a child and moving them from one state to the next remains on the state level. It's not prosecutable by federal law. Tell me there's no conspiracy. Jesus, it's so true. It's so true. And then again, that other point, We've been talking about it for a while, right? What was happening in the political social dialogue right before this whole lockdown? It was all about who was the most oppressed. That was, it was the victim Olympics, which is still going on, but this has kind of taken over the breath. But what was going on with the rise of Jordan Peterson and so many other people trying to combat this idea of people looking for equality? This is the Karl Marx manifesto written by Adam Weishaupt, by the way. But anyways, um, you, you go, all right, well, we were arguing over equality. Who's, who's the most oppressed that we should be um, you know, doing something about and paying reparations to and all that kind of stuff. You know who wins that gold medal, ladies and gentlemen? It's not a certain race. It's not a gender. It's not a certain religious group of people. It's fucking children. 
Children of all backgrounds, races, colors, creeds, and gender. Of all time. This goes back to Rome and Babylon, Greece, you know, ain't the Ottoman Empire. Holy, don't even get me started. Don't get me you if you, it's Michael a started on that. If it's, if it's a conspiracy to get four and a half people to fight that, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I'll even yeah. go if it's two and a half. If it's a blind man and his dog who can actually succeed in going up to the gates of the great institutions and stopping child molestation and child sex rings throughout this world, I'm a, you know, died in the flesh, confirmed conspiracy theorist. I'd I'm like it you. to be several million people in a country. Mm. Oh God, I guess I'm alone there then, right? If you list, if a punk like that listed what conspiracy people actually do of a day, what are their concerns of a day, the things that they're trying to stop, how would anybody with a reason, and we know the world's full of unrational people, but again, in a perfect world, if they sat and went, oh, you just want borders to be stronger, you don't want illegals pouring into the country in, the, in millions, and you don't want this and you want that, I, I would be wondering what it is that they're you know, finding so reprehensible. So the noise and the chaos in the mind of the snowflake, right? And all of their little buddies. Now they're actually getting into the Congress. All of that mental noise. And, other, and we've always also been talking here about the arrogance, right? Of these people, how they get become balloon animals. Like that thing that's in, you know, the Congress, this AOC and her little cohorts. And I've already explained in, 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 in geometric... Uh, language you know and geometrically clear that when it when you do a mark dice and you go up and you shove a microphone into these people's faces and then they say i'm feeling intimidated by your presence right you go oh how long have you been neurotic how long have you had that neurotic syndrome right things mm -hmm. change if you meet them on their own ground you lose although their narrative is very threadbare and their narrative is ultimately irrational by repetition it has gained a certain amount of strength right? Like a spasticated muscle. And I am trying to tell the world that when you engage with these people, go in with real psychological knowledge. Because when they come back at you, these soy boys and these hipster types with this paranoid, paranoic, you know, I see fear oriented verbiage about big whitey standing in, uh, you know, over me and shoving a mic, a phallic microphone in my face or whatever they come with. You have to immediately respond to that with, you know, that, oh, how long have you been a you know, constitutional, moral, inferior. You won. Because something in their back of their brain will freeze. You'll watch them lose immediately because they don't know any psychology and they don't know what the term neurotic means or paranoic, right? Or, you know, psychotic or whatever. The, you know, they don't know what displacement means, compensation, uh, reality distortion, right? And all of these things that I speak about all the time, right? And they don't know what armoring is and they don't know. So if you come at them, there's a little voice back here that, you know, the last little vestige of reality that exists within the minds of these people. Once you're in a debate and you bring up that, this little voice resonates with your voice outside. And you have this fugue moment where they go, is somebody seeing into my deepest mind? Mm -hmm. And they freeze. So it's just a suggestion. And again, it's an important tool to use. They want tools to take us down. We need the tools then to combat them. It's very simple. It's a real war of the air that we're, we're, we're dealing with here. And psychology is one of the greatest because these people are exactly as I just said, constitutional, psychological inferiors. And when you speak to them that way, it's like being a lawyer, in fact, or a psychiatrist, in fact. And how do they, do, how do they know you're not? How do they know your dad is a you know, psychiatrist general? Right? Or that you come from a family of people who really know this stuff through and through. By the way, the system's using it on us anyway with their DSMVs and all of that. Mm. Well, turn it, any weapon that they're using, learn to turn it back. It's jujitsu, it's Aikido. Yeah. And this is the way you do it. But you can even go one step further, since a lot of these people are so utterly psychologically bankrupt. Right? So that's the big weakness. Can't you see the Achilles heel there? And I would do this even if I was sitting across from you know a sort of person I knew, a colleague, who's just waffling nonsense. You know? I would I would hit them with something like, you know, so how long have you had emotional plague? Well, just you wait till they go, till a word comes out of their mouth. You just shut them up. Mm. Yeah. Have you been suffering from that for a long time? You know, armoring and all of that? Yeah. Or are you a disciple of unpleasure? <laughs> or you say, you know, uh, how long have you been avoiding reality? You know, no matter what, how an eminent person, it could be, it could be that, you know, a very senior doctor sitting behind you, ready to the one who's going to give you the vaccination, you know, but if you know, 
Better play a Saruman. But it's like you said, it's not going to be learned overnight. It's something that you comes to you with incredible work, just like it is with the martial arts. But to verbally be able to do it, mm. to have them literally shake with your presence, because they know they're not in the presence of a fucking gormless, right? Uh, fucking mush head. You just crawled out of the slime of ignorance, right? Be a Solzhenitsyn. That's that's the duty. We'll never defeat evil. You see, without a major upgrade. Right? Well, I said, why do we create unslave? What's our mission statement? Well, it's a mission statement I've been saying for twenty-one years. Upgrade. Don't don't sit here in one level. This process is holy work. It's esoteric work. And you know, I want people to matriculate in that. And you know, if you don't matriculate, then expect the blacks to take you down. This guy right? and other people like that. I'm not going to save you, because by now you should be armed with the facts. You should have read X, Y, and Z, and you should know that stuff. And not only know it, but really be able to articulate it. You know, when you come into, if and when you want to gain, you know, get into discourse with these people, then do it so excellently well that you literally, you know, your words actually have power over them. And I believe there is actually a way to do that, by the way. I there agree. are actually ways to do that. We can't get into it in this show, but there's definitely, there are ways of doing that where you can put the fucking hex right on them by getting into their little ego and unmasking it. And that's a, a form of mental martial arts. 100%. And speaking of um, professors, so for those of you who need some professors, we've mentioned, uh, just take notes of all the names that Michael's been dropping throughout this and go back and look at it again. And we'll, we'll get some links in here for you too. But you know, you can think of people like Professor Anthony Sutton, you know, one of the most eminent investigators. Go watch an interview with that man. And you tell me how brilliant he is and how psychotic he is and how tinfoil crazy he is. The man is the man will destroy you in 10 seconds in a debate. Uh, he he was the one that gave to me a major key to my entire cult series, which was what he described as the three levels of information. You have the public level, you know, built by the academics and the, and the media. It's not, it doesn't have any semblance of truth. And if it does, he says it's just coincidental that it's true. The second level is for the academics to fall for. And the third level is the actual truth that's gleaned through a battle that has to take place to get FOIA requests, to investigate, do the process that you're saying, the painstaking elimination of what's untrue. Um, it's only the cream of the crop Sherlock Holmes type people that get to that level three. And so... To say that, oh, it's just simple. Occam's razor. That's how you find the truth. I don't even know what to say to you. It's ridiculous. But here's another not one. I'm gonna... truth. No, not this one. Not this truth. Not the kind of stuff we're talking about. No, no. But here's another uh, professor that I'm going to bring up here. I've been reading a lot of his books lately. Dr. Kerry Bolton. I got an article, a couple quotes, and a book to cite because I want to pay this man the proper respect. Just to give you a background... Dr. Kerry Bolton has certificates and doctorates in theology, social work, studies, psychology, and a PhD honoris causa. He's a fellow of the Academic or the Academy of Social and Political Research in Athens and the Institute for Higher Studies in Geopolitics and Auxiliary Sciences in Lisbon. Contributing writer for Foreign Policy Journal and regular contributor to the New Dawn in Australia, the Great Indian Dream Institute of Planning and Management. And he's been published by all kinds of scholarly uh, you know, articles, studies, journals. He's been in the broader media on various subjects. He's spoken at Trinity College. He's been to Moscow University. He's been on all kinds of... The guy's accolades will make this chump look like sliced bread, kindergarten level, okay? Now, let's see what he has to say about conspiracy. This one, I don't think that many of the professors living in my country are really going to like. But here fucking it is, is anyways... How about this article that I'm going to post a link to? How communism was fermented in secret societies for hundreds of years. Okay? Hundreds of years. This is a part of it. How it was written, the doctrine, where it came from, how it was used within many of these secret societies. The order of Marxism, the order of Memphis. You know, getting into Karl Marx, the Marx's Lodge. There's actually a lodge named after Karl Marx. The first international all the sightings and all the studies, you know, and the man has written books on it. Mm -hmm. And now here's a few quotes, okay? Because I want to just give me a sec here and I'll, I'll go through this real quick. And then I'd love your comments, Michael, here. So, um, it, it, oh, that's the video. Where's my slides? So this is the book that you got to pick up. It's called The Occult and Subversive Movements. 
So he's getting into secret societies. Okay, so let's just get a little smattering from the introduction where he's asking. So this prestigious professor is asking, are there conspiracies? Now, bear with me here. Here we go. Much of what has been considered so far already sounds like conspiracy theory. The allegation that someone is a conspiracy theorist is supposed to shut down a discussion immediately, having a similar effect as alleging that someone is a Nazi or an anti-Semite, a Holocaust denier, racist, and so forth. The instant ridicule of conspiracy theories, especially from academia, is fairly predictable, given that scholars, quote-unquote, tend to be narrowly focused and quite incapable of synthesizing knowledge from a variety of disciplines. There's also the pull of conformity and respectability within academia. There are noteworthy exceptions, such as Dr. Richard Spence, chair of the History Department of the University of Ohio, who teaches an honors program on the role of secret societies in history. So there's a conspiracy with theories, guys. This whole course is written about this in official universities. And he also, also dark, Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Mirabello, professor of history at Shawnee State University, who teaches on many subjects relevant to this book, including legend, myth, and folklore, intellectual history, Gnosticism, alternative religions and cults, revolutionary Europe, etc. I'd like his comments on Gnosticism. That'd be interesting. The law courts hear evidence for criminal conspiracies every day. There are financial conspiracies, such as insider trading. The mafia is generally accepted as a centuries-old international criminal conspiracy whose tentacles starting from families in the hills of medieval Sicily have come to encompass many states, to have influenced politicians, and to have had the rich and powerful in their entourage or on their payroll. The same can be said of the Chinese triads, which have had a major political influence. There have been conspiracies that have been both religious and criminal in nature, such as the thuggy in India. The Ku Klux Klan is a secret society that achieved imminence, imminent political influence during the 1920s. Yet if someone suggests that there might be political conspiracies involving Freemasonry, occult societies, or banking dynasties, this is laughed out of court by orthodox academia. There is nothing particularly extraordinary about the existence of conspiracies. A conspiracy is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as a plan, a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful, a conspiracy to destroy the government, a criminal conspiracy is defined in U.S. law as conspiracies against the public or such as endanger the public health, <laughs> note Big Pharma, violate public morals, media, insult public justice, there you go, destroy the media peace, or sorry, destroy the public peace or affect public trade or business. That such conspiracies exist is obvious enough, but we are expected to disregard any such notion when it comes to secret societies, bankers, political lobbies, etc., and then this is just a quick uh, little segment I wanted to bring up as well to give you a little bit of history here. The beginnings of conspiratorial theory, the French Revolution, the allegation of an occult conspiracy to establish a universal republic on the ruins of altars and thrones arose during the tumult of the French Revolution. So this guy wanted to talk Weishaupt. Well, here you go. The Grand Orient de France, with the Grand Orient branches spreading throughout Europe and distinct from the English form, had an anti-clerical and radical political orientation, bringing Masonry into conflict with the Catholic Church. Catholic responses to Freemasonry have included many books by cardinals and laymen alike. The French cleric, the Abbe Augustin Borel, was among the first writers to ascribe occult influences to the French Revolution, and his views have remained seminal. In 1797, he wrote the five-volume memoir, uh, my French is horrible here, but Persevere, uh, the History of Jacobisms. He's talking about the history of the Jacobins. Tracing the origins of revolution and subversion to the Knights Templar. This Templar theme has continued to the present with such popular books as The Temple and the Lodge. And Burrell wrote, At the early period of the French Revolution, there appeared a sect calling itself Jacobin and teaching that all men were equal and free. In the name of their equality and disorganizing liberty, they trampled underfoot the altar and the throne. They stimulate all nations into rebellion aimed at plunging them ultimately into the horrors of anarchy. It was under the auspices of this sect and by their intrigues, influence, and impulse that France beheld itself a prey to every crime, that its foil was tainted with the blood of its pontiffs and priests, of its rich men and nobles, with the blood of every class of citizens without regard to rank, age, or sex. So that's just that's just the opening page of the book. 
and the whole book and all the art and we could go on and on and there's many things like we could touch on the templars the, the jacobins washington spoke about the jacobins and then the comparing it to the wackadoodle left wing today it's an easy connection to make that let's just put it the way george carlin said do you really think that people in powerful places with lots of money don't get together and plan shit like seriously we're crazy for thinking that and even if we don't have like there's the evidence we could get into but just philosophically they're telling you in a court of law you could be convicted of criminal conspiracy of one form or another but it's they're immune the government fucking right this guy this piss pot i'm glad you read that because this piss pot when he was talking about the illuminati just forgot to tell you that when the bavarian government closed them down they called it a conspiracy <laughs> right the bavarian government caught them all Jeez. found the documents and called it a conspiracy the duke of brunswick other potentates and they and they didn't just say call it a conspiracy they called it a very very powerful one that was undermining their powerful structures actually they were not very much better a lot of these people you know please get me straight on that but it's a rivalry between secret societies and that's what i go to i go to those just like Kerry bolton does his books are great we go to the other sources but you see, the fact is a lot of those great books, Abbe Borel's book and all, mm. wasn't translated into English until very you know, recently and stuff like that. And right. there's many other books that he would have sourced, the Abbe, you know, that also have never been translated. So in the West, we're actually kind of bereft of a lot of the actual brilliant books that did expose conspiracy, both in Russia and elsewhere. Two names I would also add for people to listen to, maybe you can put links below, who are even more eminent than Kerry. And that's one is Nicholas Hager, H-A-G-G-E-R. And the other one would be Sir James, uh, sorry, James Billington, who wrote Fire in the Minds of Men. Mm. Mail a couple of copies of that book to your, you know, our lovely friend here, and uh, you will find out that he is not at home. Just you may, somebody out there mail to this Professor Black a book called Fire in the Minds of Men and ask him to return, you know, Read it and then, uh, you know, give a synopsis of that book, how it's all, uh, you know, unfalsifiable. Yeah. You see, it's we can do it. We can uh, we can add all of this to the mix, right? Uh, when Kerry was mentioning Ku Klux Klan, he's quite right that that's a conspiracy because that was formed by the Scottish Rite. They were called the Knights mm. of the Golden Circle and, and Albert Pike, the supreme leader of the world illuminati at that time it was adriano lemmy right and it was uh giuseppe mazzini but when they died he took over so the guy who actually did in fact create the Ku Klux clan it is a secret society you know is one of the greatest uh formers actual you know establishers of other powerful secret societies but this piss pot we need to walk we need to he's in he's the one in kindergarten he's the one who's got the stabilizers on his legs He's the one crawling around in all floors, fours, because has he ever heard of the Shriners? Has he ever heard of Scottish Rite? These are, or has he ever heard of uh, D, the De Molay Society? Has he ever heard of the Jesuits and Opus Dei? Mm. See, all his audience have, whether it's through a movie, I'm not, I'm not critiquing that. People now know, this is the thing, people are aware of who, there's this group called the Jesuits, right? Or there's this group, Opus Dei, or there's this group, the Scottish Rite let alone Grand Orient, you know what we were talking about, Grand Orient, that is one of the most sinister organizations coming out of originally Scotland and then moving to France, strict observance, you know, all the things we deal with in, in, in the programs. If this guy wants to come to the table, let him do so. I'll take him on any day of the week. Because another thing I've always spoken to of my audience, which I suggest, not only that we arm ourselves with a certain, you know, vocabulary and eloquence and all of that, but to, to fight them from within sight, within their own academia. Mm. Don't come with external stuff they will not accept. Come with your Billingtons. Come with your Kerry Boltons. Come with your Nicholas Hagars. Right? Only reference people that are from their world, not your world. That won't work. Come with Lieutenant James Bo Greitz, et cetera. Right? Smedley Butlers, right? Uh, John Stormers, right? Uh, James Perloff and, and other people like I mentioned from within right from within and you will find out that they suddenly forgot to mow the lawn for granny and they're gone puff of smoke gone you've won the day suddenly they realize they left the you know the coffee machine on it's so true it's so true if and you lose 
If you lose, here's the formula. If you lose against this guy or anybody else, it's your fault. That's right. That I'm afraid I have to be harsh. But you didn't you, do your push-ups. I don't care who it is, even if it's a, a dickhead at the end of the street you, or your teacher at your college. First of all, don't engage them. If you do and you lose the debate, then you got to get back to the drawing board because mm. this is holy work and you're meant to be a disciple of it and the defender of it. Then all I can say is be a Lancelot, you know, be a Ga be a fucking Galahad, chop him to pieces, have no mercy, no quarter. Well, I think we've chopped them to pieces in every way you could, but let's just compare notes, okay? So if you're thinking, well, prestigious Canadian Professor Dave versus all the, what, how many names did we drop? 137 so far? Let's take a look at his bibliography of all of his recommended books that went along with his webinar, shall we? Check it out. These are the eminent people. Rob Brotherton, Suspicious Minds, Why We Believe Conspiracy Theories. Nancy Rosenblum, a lot of people are saying the new conspiracism and the assault on democracy meaning communism. Cass Sunstein is an eminent person. Conspiracy theories and other dangerous ideas. Joseph Ruskinski, American conspiracy theories. Jesse Walker, the United States of Paranoia, a conspiracy theory. You know what's crazy? I've read three of the books that he's recommended already just to compare and contrast because there's the difference. For those that, that have accused me publicly in the last week, of not looking at the other side. Dave, you're only looking at one side of the story by always posting these conspiracy theories. Do you think I just go and find a conspiracy blog and post it? I, in order to get to that point of confidence, be able to come here and present, do all this work, do all the inner work, do all the research. I've got piles of books from all sides of the arguments to compare and contrast in order to formulate my theory. And I didn't just wake up and go, dude, I think there's a conspiracy, man. I think they're trying to eat our brains. This, I didn't, that's, that's for, that, that's not me. I, I go out there thing. and I source it all. And I also look just as, I watch just as much mainstream news and listen to all these scientists going, I sat in your webinar for an hour, bored to tears, waiting for you to answer a question. So I showed up. Will you show up? Will you read these? Will you read Bolton? Will you read um, Carol Quigley, who was an insider? Will you read all their books before you come out and try to slather oh, us with Quigley. that? That's yeah, fuck. That's could go on forever. Another one. Carol Blinken Quigley, who exposed this. The, not, he was, he's exposing the round table, which is one of the most powerful societies mm. of modern times that every single president and every member of Congress has been picked, handpicked by that group. So, yeah, CFR, any of that. And there's been many a mighty mind, but they won't. You see, you could phone them up and make the invitation and they will not come. I, I guarantee you that. Right. Cause they're the ones in reality distortion. See the, 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 the person who has got these elements that I'm talking about, the emotional plague is a reality distorter. And the last thing they want to engage in is somebody who's going to undistort their reality. Mm. And that's us. Oh yeah. We have power. They have control. I don't sit around going, poor me, I wasted my life. Yeah. No, 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 no. I've been on the pursuit of wisdom for many an age. Minute by minute, second by second, day by day, month by month, you wouldn't even believe the journey. So I'm standing high, not in an arrogant way, right? But I'm armored with truth. They're haters of truth. I've, I've fortified my mind. I've read books. And here's another thing. If I list, if we list back every single one of the authors that we've just mentioned in this, you know, discussion, I don't agree with all of their work. Mm -hmm. So if he was a phenomenologist who came in to see what we actually do, he'd go, you, you disagree with whole chunks of Hager and whole chunks of uh, Kerry Bolton. Go, that's right. Well, this look very insane. You're ruining my reality. I come in here thinking he was a crazy nutter. And every time I talk to you, you show me you're a very rational, normal, normal, you know, person. They go, well, yeah, that's what I am. What, what's your problem? Where did you come off thinking we're all madmen? Right? Yeah, I don't agree with it all. That shows discrimination and discernment. The very things they're telling us we don't have, we're going to have to make little handrails for them. You know, we have to have little, uh, you know, warning signs and red flags, uh, you know, to re-education camps. These people. Yeah. yeah, poor guys. You know, do I look like infantile to you? I don't even agree with everything that I read. I've read every book Albert Pike ever wrote. He's a genius. I can recite all his great work, but I know he was the head of the Illuminati, and yeah, I would shoot him. How do you work that shit out? Does that look insane to you, or does that look true to you? 
I've read all that Karl Marx has read, probably more than this fucker has. We did that on the pr first program to show, right? And we've shown what is needed in every front. So again, if somebody was to create a graph of the successes and fails, right? There'd be nothing but successes because they'd see that you're impartial. They'd see that you were unbiased. And this unfalsifiability nonsense that this other fucker is talking about, he'd find out that he's the one who's the, de the deficient. Because in intellectual, emotional, right, uh, terms, in terms of time management, like you just said, and in discernment, they wouldn't be able to falter. So bring it on, but not him. Don't let that piss pot around because he's a fucking, by his all statements he's already made and those other ones we had to deal with in the program one. I don't want to negotiate with those people. Because to me, they're not sane. They're not up to the job. They're just muck slingers, right? And if they can't throw stones, they'll throw dust. Yeah, well, that's not the kind of person I want to sit down with. I want somebody very eminent, but very unbiased. And those people actually do exist in universities as well. So I will sit down with any of those people. And I will calmly you know, show them the facts, what I've got. And I will listen to their judgment and walk on. But see, my journey does not involve you know, uh, being in, in any kind of consensus with anybody else. The truth is my teacher, truth against the world. Not people, not the crowd, not the other, right? I don't lock it out, but it has no bearing on the journey I'm on. If it did, I would have given up years ago and gone right. and done what every other motherfucker is doing in this world, right? Fixing computers, driving taxis, putting bean cans on shelves and retail, right? I've done all of that shit. But the thing is, nothing on this earth can dissuade me from, you know, my discipleship of truth. So I don't need them and their criticisms and their rebuttals. You know, the lesser hang, the low hanging fruit does and may give up. In fact, they may give up for plenty of other reasons than being criticized from some jerk like him. Right. When you are a disciple of truth, nothing, 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 nothing on this earth can stop you. And that's the kind of person we need. Otherwise, you won't be able to penetrate the mysteries of evil. You won't be able to diagnose, you know, all of the problems. So, yeah, you, you are vulnerable. So accept that. And then don't get in debates with these people until you're fortified because don't let them win the day. I've suggested that one way is, you know, through psychological language and vocabulary, and that's fine. But there's other ways. Pick, pick whatever method you've got and go after them, but only go after them and engage them when you know you can win. Otherwise, you're doing an injustice to the truth. You're still, you know, on a, a neophyte level or whatever novice level read these masterworks and read them unbiasedly read from the left read from the right read from in the, in the middle you know don't be looking at oh he's a jew i can't read that oh he's a this and i can't read that you're gonna not read ayn rand because she's a woman and a jew well wow what have you lost what have you lost what a tragedy you've done you've spat in the face of truth because of that that one thing desecrates you makes you lower than scum if you let any of that get in the way Sorry, uh, and many in this movement have done so. Then I just have nothing to say to you, you know. I just go, fine, that's your reality. It's not mine. I am a lover of truth. So whatever way it comes through, whom, whomever speaking it, right, I will find it. That's the job that is really required. Not looking at the jacket and saying, oh, well, that guy's, you know, he's rich or he's poor or he was black or he was white, you know. If you do that, oh my God, can you imagine? Then you don't get to read Khalil Gibran. Then you don't get to read Miguel Cervantes. Right? And and so many other names I could mention. And what a poverty. What a poverty you are then. And you're Thomas destroying Sowell. the world with your own ignorance. Yeah. Right? You're you're infecting the world with your ignorance because you won't read the masters. Powerful. And part of me as you're talking, Michael, is thinking more and more that people out there. Uh, whether witting or unwitting, that are trying to tell people to soften up their suspicion of evil and say, oh, don't listen to those people. Don't look at it. Evil doesn't exist. What are you kidding? Are you crazy? Conspiracies? Oh, come on. There's no cover-ups of any kind. Evil doesn't want to cover its tracks. Evil is obvious. It would be so obvious. See, see, because if conspiracies existed, we would need millions of people around the world to be involved with it. We don't want to talk about compartmentalization. We don't want to talk about how it really, it, how you can snap your fingers and a whole herd of sheep will jump over the fence for you. We won't talk about that. Crowd control, mass hysteria, the group mind, Gustav Le Bon. We won't bring those people in. 
We, we, we won't talk about evil, right? Because evil doesn't exist. And anybody suspicious of evil is just crazy. I have my questions about those kind of people that are telling you that. I would rather, if we're overdoing our job, I said this in my recent campfire vlog, if I'm overdoing my job, you better thank me. You better be grateful that someone has some suspicion left because right now it's all just sit down and stay locked in your homes and close all your businesses and be afraid of a virus that's a 99.7 survival rate and let your entire economies become centralized in a plan that we wanted to do before the virus. Don't think for yourself. Watch the media. Here's some... Here's some celebrities that are going to jump through some hoops for you while you're sitting at home in the one world sure. alone at home shit. Yeah, screw that, man. Suspicion is healthy. Now, obviously, we're not going to go crazy. And as we've proven, we're not a bunch of, uh, you know, end of the world is nigh type people. This is, this is intellectual pursuit. It's also a pursuit of your intuition in your heart. And you, the, other, the last point I was going to finish with, Michael, and you have brought this to me, and I'm eternally grateful for you doing this which is that it's not this whole, the, what this movement has lost. It's not about pointing your finger up at the hill, just at these evildoers throughout history. It's important to study the criminal history of humankind. Absolutely. Keep that on your desk, but never forget that every finger pointed, there's three pointing back at you. And remember, there's a conspirator within your own mind trying to turn you against your own greater true self. And so there's a conspiracy happening within each and every one of us on an individual level. So to deny conspiracy in the world or to think that it's crazy is to deny the situation happening within all of us, what Jung would call the shadow. We just did a whole thing on that. What so many other thinkers were trying to warn us about, that there's something in human beings that's working against our best interest. You can call it evil. You can call it a devil. You can call it whatever the hell you want. Archons, doesn't matter what you call it. It's there. And so a refusal to see evil in the external world isn't a refusal to see evil within your own inner world. And if you're ill-equipped and they're telling you, take your armor off, relax, sit on the beach, have it, then you're listening to not just ill-informed people. You're listening to people who are covering up on behalf of the Sorons of the world. That's just my opinion, though. That's right. And they are in fear because bestseller books are out there. You know, people have written uh, groundbreaking stuff are, are getting... Oh, Michael, you just got muted there for a second. I don't know what happened. It just cut you right. Now you're still muted. That's really weird. You can still hear me though, yeah? That's really weird. I don't have you muted here. Did we get zapped? They don't like us talking. If you want, maybe just jump back out and jump back in. I'll, I'll talk for a few more seconds here and then just come back in when you can. Um, yeah, like th to me, that's, that's where that argument is. That's where I would take the argument is to just get, you start getting personal, right? And what was another thing this person brought up that I thought was interesting? Oh, okay. He brought this up. He brought this up. It's another Oxford Dictionary thing where he was saying, we live in a post-truth world. And he did a definition. Post-truth, an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Okay, is that any better? Oh, yeah, you're back. I can hear you. I can I hear you. Just, just faulted or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the main, well, just, here, the main, I'll, I'll come back to you. I'm just on a the slide there. But yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, the main virus right now is fear, right? Because mm -hmm. under all of the other stuff we've talked about, about why these kinds of things occur at that surface underneath man is traumatized I've said it so many times before right and so when people say yeah fear this and fear is the key and all of this yeah but they really have to diagnose what that word means not use it so trivially right fear is the condition of the basis of what the kind of consciousness that we've known for thousands of years right uh, trauma is the better word obviously right but that, that's why when they lock you down like this and they're doing it to the whole world and they, they're telling you you're going to die, right? That is all a ritual, a mass ritual. Been saying that for years too, right? That the city is a mass ritual. Most of what we do, even when we're not in a lockdown situation like this, is actually ritualistic, believe it or not, right? In, in, in many, many ways. 
you know, a lot of stuff is done based on astrological timing. You know, we're not getting into all of that stuff, but just we've proven it in another work. And so right now, this is a ritual. It, actually, if you did know the astrology, what's going on like now, we've had Fiona Edgar on, we've discussed this. You can easily see that. I try to sometimes put posts on Facebook to, you know, just extremely highlight, mm. you know, a couple of the main points a little bit, a little bit uh, grandiosely. But the thing is that this is ritualistic and the greatest ritual in the hands of the controllers has been the basis of my work since the beginning is the ultimate trauma that is the fracture at the base of consciousness. And that means that it doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, pink, or whatever. All human beings on the planet who experience that, you know, who have the DNA of that, the trauma, the racial memory of it can be traumatized. There's no one who's exempt. And the big brother knows that. So don't just get caught up always in the, you know, the sort of circus at the top. Some things can be legitimate politically, other things are not. Understand the psychological point that fear is a deeper thing than we just think of, you know, like fear of death or fear. Fear is a condition of consciousness. It's actually in many ways the root of consciousness. So unless somebody is able to completely deal with that fear in a totally, you know, Bruce Lee type of martial arts way, like really meditate on it and uproot, right, the, the roots of fear from your being, get those seeds out of your being, you will always be, you know, in the past or in the future, at some time susceptible to this kind of control. It's why uh, parents continually send their kids to rotten schools and eat the wrong food. So this is manifesting on multiple levels, right? Multiple levels. And so it's a great study. But just in short, the architects of control know all about it. And most people know nothing about it. How trauma works, what is fear really, right? And how you react to fear, both not just consciously, but unconsciously. How your very autonomic system, your armoring, right? Your body, uh, your polyvagal system, your, your parasympathetic system is crippled by fear. And this is something that one has to address and really meditate on and you know and and then use these sort of uh shadows, you know like talking showing the black riders, right? How do I get my manhood like Aragorn? How do I assure myself? Does the voice come from an outside that says you'll make it? Or does the voice come from inside that I'll fucking make it? And all who wander are not lost, right? Or is it coming some more simple guys? You know, each person is on a journey to un, un, uh, release themselves from the fear, right? And once you do that, it makes a lot of headway because in any type of other trauma that's traumatizing the world, you have complete sovereignty and immunity from that, right? So that, you know, it's a good place to sort of, for me to end my comments because it is on the bigger, and as you quite rightly say, we've been looking at that, right? We haven't just been saying it's them on the hill, good old me, let's fight humanity. What, mm -hmm. in some political pigsty, in some collectivism, the very opposite of what Gustave Le Bon was saying? Oh, and by the way, write down two lines and send it off to this Professor Black. If there's no conspiracy, why did Adolf Hitler read Gustave Le Bon and say the crowd was his favorite book? Ciao! <laughs> well done. Well done. Well, speaking of concluding remarks, um... Let's do his, let's do Professor Black's concluding remarks. And just, you know, as you're reading these concluding remarks, as I've read all the different things, you tell me which case is more damned. The case of the conspiracy theorist, or I would just say conspiracy researcher, or this whole gentleman's case. Let them fall on their own sword. He says this, It's now a commonplace observation to argue that the virus has revealed some areas in society where we are inadequate and need to do better. There is sincere talk of a project of renewal relating to issues as various as health, socioeconomic inequities, oh, inequities, there's that little word they like to use, universal income, etc. So this guy's clearly a Marxist. While, while, while conspiracy theories are not unique to the COVID crisis, the importance to our health and economy of trusting medical science and acting on the best available advice has made us more self-aware of how such theories can interfere with our judgment exacerbate social tensions and stigmatize various demographic groups, leave us more vulnerable to our own capacity for irrationality, leave us open to manipulation by parties who use such theories to inflame opinion, sow distrust, monetize them, or win our vote. That's another, he had a critique of Alex Jones. He went on a rant about the fact that Jones made money off conspiracy theories. Like these institutions don't make off. What about CNN? Do they make money off their shit? What about CBS who got caught three times red-handed lying during this whole outbreak? What about them? They're making a crap load of money. Are you going to indict them? Anyways, in other words, we might consider a commitment to public rationality, civil discourse, and due care in using social media platforms as major sources of information, 
part of our post-COVID-19 renewal project, conspiracy theory is itself the ultimate conspiracy in that it conspires to leave us less rational, <laughs> more cynical, less able to live with each other and make our society work. No, it's so, the opposite. It, it actually sharpens wind. our uh, uh, Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, actually, it does the opposite. It sharpens our discernment. These are the guys who are the anti-knowledge mm. lovers. See, and then again, like we said on a million times before, the real conspiracy theorist, the died in the flesh conspiracy theorist outsider is the man who has fallen in love with the word no. No, I'm not going to do what you just said there. I'm not going to believe you. I'm not going to get into lockstep with the media. I'm not going to think the big pharma is the best thing we've ever had. I'm not going to trust the men in the white coats or anybody. I love the word no. I'm going to say it to anybody who exploits me and my family and keeps on, you know, getting me into a mode of dutifulness and obligation. And I'm going to say no to the boss. Right? I'm going to say to no. Uh, no is my favorite word. And I'm certainly going to say no to you because you're a very establishment. You are just a current on a bun, right? You, you exist because of your establishment. And the moment that you're an establishment man, if I have a, if I find critiques of your establishment, which I have found, then you are critiqued by that. I'm a free man. I have no establishment behind me, no degrees. I've jumped through no hoops. I'm completely autodidact and self-made. You are the establishment man. Therefore, if I, if I find, if I find critiques of your establishment or even the bigger society, you know, around that establishment, then you are implicated in my, uh, cond condemnation. If that makes me a conspiracy theorist, so it does. But your points are false because in multiplicity of different voices, I have to then gain the discernment. He's telling you the opposite, that you lose discernment, lose rationality. That is demonstrably false. 100%. And for those of his opening comments, and we get this all the time, where he was talking about how conspiracy theorists never want to see things get better uh, they're never offering solutions or any of these kinds of things. First of all, that's completely wrong. And second, to prove you wrong, head over to Unslave this week because our next guest, we have Erasmus and his uh, wife, Sophie, who were doing a part two on somatic intelligence, awaking somatic intelligence. And this is going to get into Reich's theory and so many other theories about how to wake up the intelligence of the body, the mind-body connection. And therein lies the beginning stages to the solutions to all the problems that we're facing here, the health problems, all these different problems. And all we can do is encourage you to think for yourself. There's the solution. Expose lies when you see them. There's the solution. Use knowledge and intuition and your reason together to navigate the world and navigate all these subjects. And don't be afraid. Use courage. Use the courage of a warrior. Be like Aragon. Be like Bruce Lee. Use your courage to think for yourself. Don't be turned into everybody else, into the same gray goop that they want you to be, this collectivist hive mind. You are a sovereign individual that is endowed with the same energy. This somatic intelligence, that's the shit that swirls galaxies. So it's gonna, we're talking about waking up, connecting to nature and all this. Tune into Unslaved, unslaved.com. That's where this battle's happening. And yes, it's paid content, ladies and gentlemen. Yep, we are there and we're, paying our way because we're being censored on all the other platforms. There's nowhere else to go. And so thanks to you, thanks to all those members that have allowed us to keep doing it. We keep producing, I think, some of the top shelf, the most top shelf work that you can find on the internet. And it's an exchange of value for value. And it's not raking you through the coals the way so many of these other universities are and putting you in debt for 30 years after you graduate. So who's implicated in, uh, in just doing it for money? us charging to six bucks or these guys that are keeping you in debt for 30 years. So I'll leave you with that. Michael, another just juggernaut of a show. Thank you so much. Um, we'll oh, put some links welcome, to, this oh, is so important. absolutely. This is a, the time is now we're in a time of awakening. I think people are really starting to key in. They've had a lot of time on their hands. So, uh, I just encourage people. You don't have to believe us. Don't just read what we post, research what we post and we'll put all the links below. Come to your own conclusion. And thanks for joining us for this one. Yeah, and we'll catch you again soon here on Truth Warrior. Cheers, everybody. Wow, dude, that was fucking epic.